Good afternoon. I'm Senator Gary Daniels from District 11. Today we will be holding a meeting of the Senate Finance Committee. Before we get started, I'll read through a checklist to ensure that the meeting we are holding is in compliance with the right to know law. As chair of the Senate Finance Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04 and its extensions, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. In accordance with the emergency order, I'm confirming that we are providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possible by video or electronic means. We are utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting. All members of the committee and selected legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously in this meeting through this platform, and the public has access to contemporaneously watch and or listen to the meeting on Zoom or YouTube and via phone by following the directions and links provided on the general court website. We have provided public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting in the Senate calendar. We are providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anyone has a problem, please email remote senate at leg.state.nh.us or call 603-271-6942. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, it will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Finally, let's start the meeting by taking roll call attendance. When each member states his or her presence, please also state where you are and if anyone is in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. I will call roll. Senator Rosenwald. Good afternoon, Cindy Rosenwald, District 13. I'm in the Senate chamber. Senator Guida. Senator Bob Guida, District 2, present in the Senate chamber. Senator Hennessy. Aaron Hennessy from Littleton in the Senate chamber. Senator Morse. Senator Chuck Morse, I'm in the Senate chamber. Senator D'Alessandro. Senator Lou D'Alessandro, I'm at home in Manchester and my wife is in the house. Yeah, Senator Reagan is excused. Uh, will be joining us later, and uh, I am Senator Gary Daniels, and I am in the Senate Chambers. Our first order of business today is with the Division of Medicaid Services, and we welcome them today. Good morning. Uh, Deb, I'm, I apologize. I'm sure this will happen throughout the day. Uh, we also need David Weeders uh, to be brought over, and I'm let Henry know not to share his screen until he makes it over. So Henry, if you wanna start the presentation or um, at least do the introductory while she brings Dave over, they do have the presentations in front of them. Oh, there he is, so you're good to go. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Daniels and members of the committee. I'm pleased to be able to present the Medicaid uh, budget to you this afternoon. Um, with me is Athena Gagnon, who is the Director of Medicaid Finance, and David Weeders, who oversees um, IT for the department. Um, and um, I'm going to bring up the share screen with the slide deck right now, if that's okay. Yes. Um, so moving along um, to uh, uh, the slide here. Um, this is what we um, look to cover today. Um, I won't read the, the slide to you, but these, these are the point, bullet points that we would look to cover over the course of this meeting. Um, I think that you know, Medicaid is probably one of the more well-known programs with respect at least to the health insurance component of it. And you know, basically the, the department uh, and division of Medicaid services tries to provide a very um, effective and efficient program for the nearly one in seven that we typically serve um, during the public health emergency. Um, we're now serving, servicing approximately one in six. Um, Medicaid is a program that's offered by all 50 states. There are um, 
mandatory and eligible and optional groups that uh, you can cover. Um, New Hampshire, as you know, has the Grant Advantage Healthcare Program as one of its optional groups. Um, talk a little bit about today as we weave in here that uh, there is a federal um, public health emergency that's declared um, at a federal level that um, impacts the amount of federal matching percentage that we can draw. Um, and that uh, draw um, is uh, through the end of the quarter on which the um, public health emergency ends. We'll speak to the ending a little bit, but uh, right now the public health emergencies have been extended through till July. I just wanna make sure the senators are hearing me okay. You're good. Good. <clears throat> um, I think I wanted to have uh, Athena address this slide for us. It's basically sort of the status of the federal matching percentage at this point. Athena, if you wanna pick up from here for a couple slides. You're on mute, Athena. There we go. That's much better, right? Nice. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to um, go over this slide with you. I wanted to map out for you the enhanced FMAP that we've received to date compared to what our standard FMAP would be. So beginning with January of 2020, states are allowed to go retroactively to the first day of the quarter in which the public health emergency period started. So we were allowed to go back to January of 2020. So I have it broken out by the four different populations, standard Medicaid, which normally receives the standard FMAP of 50%. During the public health emergency period, we are allowed to receive an enhanced FMAP of 6.2%. Breast and cervical cancer typically receives a standard match of 65%. During the public health emergency period, we have been claiming an additional 4.34%. Now CHIP is a little different because it was slated to slowly start to reduce uh, to get to a standard of 65% in Fed fiscal year 21. So again, throughout the quarters, we've been claiming an additional 4.34% over the standard enhanced FMAP for CHIP. Now family planning services, we only ever receive an enhanced FMAP of 90%. We were not allowed to claim anything over that 90%. And Athena, that bottom, yeah. Athena, when we get to, to family planning, do you want to go through this presentation and then we should query you about this? Yes. About family planning? Okay. Yes, please. Right. Okay, with thank a name, you. With a name like Athena, I, I always gravitate toward the goddess of love. And I know you're there and doing great things for me. So please uh, accept my apologies for interrupting, but I'll get you at the end. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So this bottom table, I just wanted to demonstrate what we have budgeted. You know, you're faded out. Is that the better? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. I wanted to just demonstrate for you what we have budgeted in the Senate phase change request. We have changed our assumptions to budget an enhanced FMAP, assuming that the public health emergency period ends in October. And we would be claiming the enhanced FMAP through December of 2021, anticipating that we will get to pre-COVID levels by January 1 of 2022. And this is a change from our original agency phase budget, as well as what was carried through during the governor and house phase. We did know obviously um, in August or September of 2020 where the COVID pandemic would bring us as far as economically and our caseload. We had assumed at that point that we would be at pre-COVID levels by July of 2021. We decided not to make any budget change requests during the governor or house phase as we would know more about how the pandemic and economic recovery would play out. Ready for the next slide? If you know. Yes, please. So this is an important slide. We update and monitor our enrollment on a daily basis. And what we wanted to show you here was how our caseloads have actually increased 
from pre-COVID um, numbers, caseload numbers. So for the period of March 16, which was two days before the pandemic was, was determined, um, through April of 26, broken out by our Granite Advantage and our standard Medicaid population. Granite Advantage has increased over 23,000 members or 46%. Our standard population has increased over 18,000 members or 14.4%. If you combine those two programs together, the Medicaid program has increased by 23.6%. Now this bottom section here identifies point in time trend for our various population groups. The largest growing population is the adult expansion group at 46%. The second and third highest trending increases in our caseload is with the low income non-disabled adults followed by the low income children or our CHIP population. So um, picking up on slide nine, um, what I just wanted to show uh, the senators is that the uh, growth in enrollment has been uh, across the board in each of the categories across the state. And um, again, I won't read all the statistics here, but you can see, um, you know, in the Granite Advantage is 40%. This is about the floor to a high of over 50%. And um, oh, again, I won't read through this, but this just gives you a sense that the growth in enrollment um, has been across the board in the state. It's not just isolated to certain areas. Um, so in, in the, um, our presentation today, there's three areas that um, Karen, I think, touched on as part of the OCOM presentation with you on Friday. Um, you know, Senate Bill 150, uh, which I know passed the Senate, at least on a policy basis, 24 to nothing. Um, in terms of actually implementing that, uh, we um, look to uh, request in state fiscal year 23 with a start date of, of one of uh, 23. And so that we would need 1.4 million in general funds to accomplish that total funds of 2.9. Again, I think pushing it out to that date makes sense given all that's going on and to allow the enrollment to reach a more normal, normal level so it's more affordable. Um, I know in and out um, the, was discussed also on Friday. Um, I think what I'd highlight here is that because of the public health emergency in state fiscal year um, 22, we can calibrate down to 2.7 million, uh, what would be required in general funds um, because it, at, during the public health emergency, people are not going out, they're just staying enrolled in the program. And then the additional funding to uh, accomplish the extended um, home visiting uh, for prenatal uh, and child and family, that uh, the appropriation there, um, we need some additional money to be able to fully implement what was in the original Senate Bill 274. Um, Athena, this is our um, change request table that you know, we can walk through here. Um, and if I need to move the screen around, please let me know. Demonstrate you know, you is it yeah. itemizes your um, your mic isn't up. Is that better? Can you hear me better now? Okay. So this slide demonstrates the budget change request for the Division of Medicaid Services by accounting unit. So I'll just go through them briefly. The Medicaid administration account, we're asking for an increase in 22 and a decrease in 23. It's 100% federal funds and it's to align with the New Hampshire hospital dish budget. The next item is the state phase down and it's to fund the premium increases. When we built the agency phase budget in September of 2020, we didn't know at that point in time what the Medicare rates would be for calendar year 21. They're published in October of each year. So what this does is just level sets what the rate increases will be. And I think this was also request of the governor to add to this phase from the house. Correct. Thank you, Henry. 
Now for the CHIP accounting unit 7051, it actually shows a decrease in general funds and total funds in general. What we did build into this budget was the increased FMAP anticipated to be received through December of 2021. We also included, you'll see under the agency, a negative a decrease in the agency budget of 100,000. That is to account for the drug rebate because during the public health emergency, once we get the drug rebates, we have to reimburse the federal government at that higher federal match. There is no change in 22, obviously, because in 23, excuse me, because we're anticipating that we'll be at pre-COVID FMAP at that point in time. For 79.48, what I've itemized here, again, is the decrease back to pre-COVID levels in enrollment in January of 2022. The decrease in agency income in fiscal year 22, again, is tied to the drug rebates. No change in fiscal year 23. What we've also included in the 22 and 23 budget is an increased federal match for family planning for the capitation payments. It's something that we have not yet done to date. We've been working with CMS to get them to approve a methodology to claim that enhanced FMAP. The next items on the list are tied to additional change requests, which Henry covered in the prior slide, to fund transitional housing, rates and increased beds, the medically needy in and out, and funding the adult dental program. Okay, to the next slide. Yes, thank you. So this is just a different view of the detail that I just went through itemizing by accounting unit and what the initiatives are that we're trying to fund. Yeah, thank you, Henry. And the next two slides demonstrate and compare the 20 actual, the 21 adjusted authorized, the governor and house budgets compared to uh, the total requested changes that we're asking for during the Senate phase, again, by accounting unit. The detail for these are in the prior two slides. It's a continuation of, of that, right? Thank you. So um, I'm going to pick up from here. I guess the the one thing that I wanted to highlight on this slide, because I know OCOM covered um, the staffing situation in Medicaid, probably our, our largest need is in the MMIS area. Um, currently we have a 100% vacancy rate. Um, the governor um, also added uh, temp position there. So we're technically right now um, eight positions down um, to, um, to cover that in terms of um, what's included in the budget in terms of implementing it um, and why it's important. I'm gonna transition the next uh, slide to Dave Weeders um, to speak to, to that. And I'll, I'll probably add a little bit of commentary, but I guess I would say that, and if you're looking at the, the house to um, governor comparison that the, the house and the governor um, funded it at nearly equal levels, uh, the house uh, put, um, funding in the HB2 as opposed to HB1. Uh, Dave, I'll have you come in at this point? Thank you, Henry. Again, my name is David Weeders. I'm the Information Services Director for HHS. And I just wanted to start with the MMIS or the Medicaid Management Information System. As you know, it's been around for, for many years. In 2015, uh, we certified the system, which provided an additional 25% of federal matching funds reducing the burden on our state's general fund. So that, that's important. In order to maintain our certification, we have to do certain things. Um, one of them is ensuring that the security and the software and the hardware is, is maintained at a current version of support and, and um, sustainability. 
in order to do that, we submitted a budget for the two contracts that maintain this system. The conduit contract for 9.9 .9 million per year for the next five years is our planned extension, but 9.9 .9 million for the next um, next two years for the biennium. And then for our, our NTT data contract, which is our quality assurance contract, which is required by Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services to have a third party quality assurance contractor review all changes to the MMIS system is, is budgeted for 2.2 million each year in general funds. So those are general fund dollars of impacts. Um, and those are really important to maintain our, what we call life cycle management of the equipment, uh, the hardware, the software, and the, the overall running of the system. There's many other things on the slide. I'm basically talking to our re-procurement strategies on how we're moving forward in the future. But if we can move to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the additional items that are budgeted in the MMIS um, line items, which is really penalties to a, a, that were associated with a lack of funding in this current biennium to implement services. So what we, by the 21st Century CARES Act required all states to implement electronic visit verification system, which is goal to support the prevention of fraud and abuse of the, of the billing and claims of the systems, as well as ensuring that the patients receive the services that are being billed. We are currently, submit, we submitted an electronic visit verification system capital budget or EVB capital budget to implement in this next biennium to reduce our, our penalty burden in the, in the future years, but we are currently incurring penalties right now. Based off of the the current penalties, you'll see on this slide, it says 22, 23 EVB penalties of 3.1 million. In actuality, after discussing with CMS, they're gonna incur the personal care fees of 1.5 million in the next biennium. And we will be on the hook for the home health care penalties if we, if we continue to not implement the EVB system in, the, in this next biennium. So the reality is, at the, at the very, very high level, our budget right now is to currently maintain and operate the MMIS system, and then also address the penalties that we're already, um, already being billed for in this, bi this biennium and will be billed for in the future biennium. Just a quick question, David, on that. What, what are we being billed for as we speak in terms of a penalty? That's something I can go back and work with Athena and the finance team, but I'm, I think it's just under half a million for this year. For this year. That's a, I believe a half percent, uh, Senator, to start with uh, as of January 1 of, um, of FMAP penalty on personal care services is what it starts and it increases over time as a percentage. Well, and, and, in, and in, order to, in order to conform, we need what, 12.2 million in 22, 23, and then a maintenance cost of 19.3? So I apologize. Yeah. I apologize, Senator um, Del Sandro. No, the, the full budget is to com be compliant with all of the uh, state and federal legislations to run the system. The EVV system itself is a capital budget submittal of $5.6 million to implement, of which we're getting 90, we're, we're anticipating 90% federal matching dollars. So the general fund burden is $564,000. That's not listed in here because it would be discussed in the capital budget hearing. Okay. Thank so you. I think the, the major thing of just jumping back one slide is, you know, the, the software and hardware we're running on is dates back to 2007. And that in terms of from a security standpoint, and from a uh, life cycle support by software vendors, we're reaching the point where a whole system certification's at risk. And, um, you know, in terms of the shortfall um, over last, uh, the current biennium, that the, the shortfall, if we lose that certification, is worth as much as what it would take to, to, to provide it compliantly. That's that $6.6 .6 million number here oh. on slide 17. So I think the, the issue is we're kind of, we've we've delayed as long as we can. And now we're at risk both financially as well as from a security standpoint, both from you know protecting um, 
health information as well as you know uh, failure of the system in terms of concerns about uh, being able to pay providers timely, which is very important. We know. Um, of course, I think. <laughs> but but when we when we get into this software business, don't we don't we purchase upgrades or don't we have contractual service that says when a new rev comes, we're, we're in the we're in the queue to get it, and that's how we stay. That's the, how we stay ahead of the game. I that's mean. A- Sorry, Senator. That's a very valid point, Senator. Um, yes, we normal we do that with all our existing contracts. This original contract at the direction of CMS back in 2007 was um, directed for us to own and you know, own all the hardware and software per, as a state. The newer contracts, what we do and we will with this this renewal, incorporate those costs and and have the burden on the vendor to maintain and operate those additional revs. So going forward, this, the new contract and the new funds that, that the funds that we're requesting will, will do exactly what you're, you're indicating, which is the way um, business works in, in most environments. Yeah. So that's changed their direction over the last um, 10 years on how we can write our contracts, allowing us to do this now. Right. Because it hasn't this been, and I don't want to spend a great deal of time because you, you're very, time is very valuable. But but this MMIS thing has been on the plate. I've been around here a long time. It's been around for a long time, these problems, like forever. Senator D'Alessandro, if I could yes. address that a bit. I think it, going back in, in time, um, you know, the, the system was purchased and um, the implementation was started when we were under a fee-for-service uh, approach to providing all the Medicaid benefits and the transition to um, to managed care occurred after the start of it. So I think a lot of the startup problems were associated with the change in policy. I think that reflected in, if you will, the, the, the more, if you will, modern approach to do this is more on a modular basis so that right. you're um, not taking that kind of risk um, yeah. that we took back then. Um, right. But sure. in terms of, in terms of, um, you know, there, there are certainly challenges with the system, but in terms of many, many respects, this in terms of like federal reporting of um, uh, the certain indicators that we have to provide, we're able to accomplish what we need to do, but it's at, at risk, you know, going forward. At this sure. Point. Okay. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. So I think um, that this brings us back to if there's any specific areas of the Athena that the senators would like to get into um, where we could we where we can find those in the Senate briefing book, I believe. Um, so we're, we would love to take questions that the senators have at this point. Well, I, I just want Athena. Is this the time to ask questions about family planning and the family planning program? <laughs> Tina? Yes, uh, you have a question, Senator D'Alessandro? Uh, yeah, yes, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, at the beginning, I asked, uh, my question was, when when would it be appropriate to uh, get some background questions on the family planning program? I think, we're, I think we can take those if that's okay with you, Senator Daniels. Is it okay, Senator Daniels? I, I didn't hear the answer. Oh, excuse me, go ahead. If it's okay with you, Senator Daniels, we can take those two things up. There's actually, I think, two things that we need to cover on family planning. One is, I think, the additional federal claiming that we're um, positioning ourselves to do. And I think the other relates to Senator D'Alessandro's wanting to go a little bit more in depth on family planning. Yes, uh, you might go ahead. Uh, Athena, do you want to start here, please? Alessandro, what are your specific questions? Well, sp- specifically, how many patients were served in the current biennium under the family planning program? That I do not have the definitive answer on that. That would have to be a follow-up item. But... Okay. I, I have that. Um, if you give me a moment, keep going. Sure. Well, I, I just, it, 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 is this a typical amount? Of, once we get that number, is it a typical amount? Was it lower because of the pandemic? And should we expect an increased number in the upcoming biennium because of the economic variables that are due to the pandemic, the services? I'm going to bring up a slide here, hopefully. Okay.
try to make this bigger. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, um, fortunately, the controls are in the, the right press, press the plus sign. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to I need to move the there we go. Oh, great. A lot better. Yeah. So the um, family planning um, is right on this line right here that I've highlighted, which I think there's some discussion of family planning from a public health standpoint. These are the people who have the family planning. Um, you can see that there's been a, an increase um, um, in, in recent months, but it's lower than it was back in um, around the start. The pandemic was around 836. Today, we're sitting at 722 at the end of, end of March. Do you think that was a result of, of, of the pandemic and will it increase now that we're moving out of the pandemic? Uh, you know, I, I don't really have a, a sense that we're talking about, you know, more than 100 either way, uh, Senator. I think that people may have been able to qualify temporarily for a, a more generous uh, category because of income issues. So I would think that we might see some drift as the public health emergency ends from say other uh, eligibility groups back to this uh, based on people's income status. What, what, we, what we heard in the, in the morning presentation from uh, Employment Security was that many people were making, were making more money under the, you know, under the benefit program. And as a result of that, may have lost the ability to get certain services. Is, is that a correct assumption? Because they, they, and, and uh, they were, they were, as a result of that, it, the individual income in the state increased. Senator Del Sandro, thank you for the question. The, the federal additional monies did not count against eligibility. Um, so they, there was an income, if you will, disregard in terms of the additional um, uh, unemployment assistance. So that may not have been a factor. Um, yeah, the state assistance was subject to, to, to that. But um, I think that, you know, generally, you know, the, the increase in enrollment that we've seen here, we had predicted at an earlier point at the very beginning, I think back in May of 2020, that we'd hit about a 39,000 increase. We had seen a, a different actuarial um, look at this that was published nationally for each state, and they predicted between 43,000 and 105,000 for New Hampshire. Um, we've been on the, on the lower end of that, where we think we still have a little bit more growth to go, um, and I think that would include family planning, but we do expect when the public health emergency ends that there'll be a certain percentage of the um, the enrollment that will uh, go back as people, you know, go back to employment. Thank Senator you. Hennessy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Henry, for taking my questions. My first question, I'm trying to understand the net impact of your adjustment on the CHIP program. And just looking at the budget, um, one, um, what, what is the increased FMAP due to the general versus federal funds for us? And is the decline, the expected decline in the program offset by the increase in the federal funds? So I see a huge decrease in federal funds overall. So uh, thank you for the question, Senator. We, sh we were going to cover this, see if it came up as a question, but in the most in the biennium we're in now, we moved um, children into one category. The, the, the um, unit that you're looking, the accounting unit you're looking at, included both chip and non-chip children, and we tried to do that so that we could have better um, budgeting going forward. As it turns out, as we've had experience um, over the biennium, we felt it was more appropriate to just include in. Um, this accounting unit, only those that we get the enhanced match on. And so we're moving back into the standard program, the 7948, um, those children who do not get the enhanced match. So what you're seeing basically is a shift in the accounting unit. We do, uh, we are picking up more federal funds for a period of time as was shown in, I think on slide seven, but that that's kind of a, if you will, the noise in that account that you're seeing, it's just a shift in just 
making it um, exclusive to those enhanced match children. Um, there's no reduction in children. We're seeing actually an increase at this point. Oh, thank you. And then I have a question on the follow-up uh, on the Medicaid to schools program. The actual in 2020 seems a lot lower than I would ex have expected because of how long the schools were open for. Um, and that, and also based on the fiscal 21 uh, adjusted authorized number. Sure. Can you, is there a time lag or something that made that number so low or? So in, in July of uh, 19, July 1st of 19, CMS issued um, some uh, guidance that pointed to some areas where New Hampshire needed to make some changes. You may remember Senate Bill 694 that it passed just before the pandemic um, started. For example, um, some of our provider types in the school setting, for example, school psychologists, um, while may have met the definition under the Department of Education, weren't qualified treatment providers under um, Medicaid. And so the, um, so the change in legislation and the change at, uh, at the OPLC level allowed some of the providers, uh, the psychologists and speech pathologists, um, to, and there were some other, not remembering off the top of my head, but allowed them to become qualified treatment providers under Medicaid. We, we had an issue of, of uh, compliance, if you will, in terms of making sure that the providers who were billing um, were um, qualified treatment providers. The second thing was that um, uh, all Medicaid services require um, an order or uh, either by a physician or a nurse practitioner or, or other qualified uh, treatment provider in so that um, there was a reliance on um, the um, I, IEP plan as being the order and we needed to move it to um, actually getting an order from a, a qualified treatment provider. So there was um, some uh, delays as, as schools um, transition to this, um, these changes. There are other changes, but those are some of the major ones that affected um, the, the billings. And um, we are able to, to claim enhanced FMAP for, for the schools. And we, we um, expanded our, our billing window for schools, but I think with the pandemic and other issues and getting things in place, um, there was a loss of, of uh, billings in that year. We expected that to, to bounce back when we put together the budget in 2000. Um, 21, um, but uh, state fiscal year 21, but obviously the pandemic um, affected that. We're with more experience and working regularly with uh, stakeholder groups in the schools where um, the number we have in this budget, I think reflects more realistically what what um, those changes may mean, um, you know, with the expansion of telehealth as well. Um, there are other opportunities to, to uh, bring back billings. Um, um, we certainly, want the schools to, to be able to uh, participate in the program um, as much as possible. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work to try to support schools. And um, we've even worked with the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation who, um, who uh, put together a, a several hundred thousand dollar grant to provide additional support to schools and helping them navigate Medicaid uh, compliantly. Thank you. Further questions? Senator Rosenwald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have some questions to follow up on family planning. Um, during the House phase um, in March, the department stated that it could be six months to a year before federal funds started um, coming back to New Hampshire. On Friday, the department, though, asked um, us in its request for one quarter's worth of general funds, $400,000, to backfill those programs. Today, I see that there's a new request uh, for family planning that's no uh, backfilling. The 400,000 is gone, and there's simply a $1.6 million decrease in federal funds. So I'm wondering when does the department expect not just a federal rule change, but 
actual federal money to support this program. So Henry, I can jump in there if you'd like. So this, that question would actually be uh, for public health. And I know okay. that Trish Tilly does have that information um, and we'll be ready to discuss it then. I, I can hold that question then. Could I follow up on? Thank you. Um, in order to, and maybe this is for Trish as well, in order to qualify as a provider for family planning, do you have to be a medical provider? I mean, are there any other providers in New Hampshire that are non-medical that could qualify that you're expecting? Generally, the, the, in order to be able to bill Medicaid, you have to be a, a qualified treatment provider as licensed by the state office of professional licensure in New Hampshire's instance. So, um, there may be a specific area that I'm not aware of that where people can do billing to public health, but in terms of the Medicaid program. Um, but not the really... crisis pregnancy centers, which are non-medical. Okay. And, and finally, um, on the House Bill 2 provision that was included in the House phase, do you, uh, could you describe what federal funds impact for Title 10 might occur with changes on the federal side? Would uh, we would be also, risking federal funds? That would also funds? that would also be a question for, for Trish. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. happy to take so I got to put my microphone on <laughs> uh, back on slide 11 yes. it, it was meant something was mentioned about family planning then but I don't see family planning anything on this page can you tell me can you review what was the comment about that it was the numbers I, I believe and he, uh, uh, Henry pointed to a line, and we talked about the increase or decrease in the number using the service. Am I correct, Henry? Yes, Senator. That what we're talking about is family planning, the the Medicaid benefit of which there's a little over 700 individuals who are entitled to a limited scope of Medicaid benefit um, paid by Medicaid, um, which I think is, if you will, not to be conflated with the public health. Uh, family planning um, group, but we we have this this small group uh, of individuals. Plus, um, we have an enhanced um, basis of collecting on um, some of the um, services that are being billed, and and that um, is all in the seventy nine forty eight. It's it's not a separate line item. We could, I think, Athena, we probably have a sub sub accounting unit to be able to provide that number and follow up if we needed to. Yeah, what that additional amount. Allowed to clean. Fading out, Athena. What we're trying to do with that change request is to accept the additional federal match for the family planning claims that are associated with the managed care capitation claims. So we're working through with CMS to come up with a methodology where we're claiming a portion of the monthly per member per month capitation rate on the MCO family related claims. Okay, so what I what I heard Henry say was all this is under 7948. Correct. But, but I turned the page and you've identified the things under 7948, but there's nothing there about family planning. So there is additional family planning funds that are Title X funds that are budgeted in the public health budget. So I think a lot of the questions that um, the committee has around this is actually questions for the Title X funds, which are in the public health budget. Okay, but I thought I just heard that the two different things. They are two different things, yes. Okay. And so the, the family planning is within the 
um, Medicaid budget for Medicaid clients and is part of the capitation payment to the Medicaid, um, to the MCOs, the Medicaid care organizations. Which is different than the award, for, that's sort of a grant-based award that public health gets. Correct. Confusing, but thank you. Use Any other further name. comments, name Senator name. Rosenwald? Thank you. I'm curious, um, what percentage of the births are in New Hampshire are currently paid for by Medicaid? I know it was 30% or a little more, I'm wondering what it is now. I think that's still a good number, Senator, around 30%, but it varies from, you know, in the upper 40s to, to you know, around 20%. And you know, typically, if, if you follow the, here's the state that have, uh, more challenging economics, you might find it 40% or more of the births are, are Medicaid and then other areas it's closer to 20%. So the geography would play a role? Geography and, and the economics of the economics, area. Sure. Right. Like, um, you know, in an inner city like Manchester, you would expect to have more than some other, in, like the more rural areas. Right. But I, th I thought your numbers stated when you started out that you said one in six, which comes out more like 15 to 17%, not 40% or 20% or 30%. So the one in six statistic center Daniels um, or the one in seven statistic is what of the entire uh, population, whether it be children or births or it's the entire, um, that slide, I believe it was slide five that had the chart that showed the, the enrollment of 219,000 you know, roughly 219,000 divided by about 1.35 million um, total population comes out to about one in six. Um, and it's more typically of the entire state, it's, it's typically more typically one in seven. And New Hampshire, just by comparison, you know, around 14 to 16% of the population in Medicaid compares favorably to um, our neighboring states of Maine and Vermont as examples. Okay, thank you. Senator Guida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can you clarify whether there's any difference between the family planning services provided under 7948 and those provided under the um, public health? Um, I think, Senator Guida, thank you for the question. I believe that's probably a better question for, um, for Trish Tilly Trish. to ad address, but... Um, uh, I think generally it would only be um, in the Medicaid program for state plan services. Um, and so it would, there may be things outside of state plan that the grants can cover, but we can only cover what's in our, our state plan. Follow, follow up. Could you provide a list of what's covered under that plan? Uh, it, it actually in the, the Senate briefing book um, under 7948, there's a, uh, um, a list of all those services that we cover, I think, at a pretty good level of detail. If, if you uh, um, would, um, my phone number here is in the presentation. If, if that doesn't answer your question, I'd be happy to follow up with you further, Senator Gatta. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Uh, I guess I would just ask, um, how, how do you determine success and the money that you're using to put toward Medicaid? Thank you for the questions, Senator Daniels. I think there are a couple of different ways of looking at it. Obviously there's um, an access metric um, there, but there are over 300 measures that we, we look at. Um, but I think um, CMS um, has a set of sort of uh, child outcome measurements, for example, for, for babies and infants, New Hampshire's typically in the top two or three in the country with respect to the metrics that um, CMS uh, monitors for that. So I think in terms of um, you know, what we do for, for children and for, for um, young children in the state in terms of our, our metrics are generally um, you know, near the top in, in the country. Um, so there are these various measures. In fact, you know, one of the things I had contemplated putting in here um, is giving a, a presentation on the quality metrics. I didn't know that we would have the time, um, be happy to um, uh, spend some additional time and show you um, the detail that we 
that we track. Um, but I think you know there are a number of areas where New Hampshire um, does well. There are some areas that we need to improve on. Um, there are some things that, like for example, you know, listening to the OCOM presentation, some of the questions you asked on Friday, you know, like the follow-up after um, an emergency room visit for someone on SUD or a psychiatric. You know, we, we've got pretty good comparative metrics, but I would say the state of the state in the country is we need to do better and we're trying to focus on doing better in those areas. So I think then the overall rating of our health plans um, by the NCQA, um, National Committee on Quality Assurance that, that accredited, accredits uh, health plans, our, our health plans have done, you know, well um, comparatively in that space. We've been typically in the, um, you know, there's a maximum you can get of five, but I think uh, in the last few years, we've had our plans either four or four and a half um, on the scale of one to five. Uh, but there's a lot we could share with you in that, that space. And um, I just didn't think we would have time to do it justice in an hour presentation. I'd be happy to follow up with you individually on that if you'd like. Okay, thank you. Seeing no further questions, uh, does that conclude the first part? Yes. Thank you, Henry thank and, you. and Dave. Appreciate thank, it. Thank, thank you very much. I the next presentation oh, is public uh, health. Uh, hold, hold on one second. It looks like Senator Rosenwald has I'm a question. Sorry, uh, thank you. I forgot to ask, in transitional housing, of the $5 million that was appropriated in the current biennium, how much is still there um, after adding 18 transitional beds and will it lapse or not? That question uh, would actually be directed to Katya um, who is up in a okay. couple of presentations. Sorry, who was on your slides. Thank you. So there are transitional housing funds in the Medicaid budget um, as well. Those were general funds appropriated specifically for new beds. Henry, do you want to speak to the transitional housing funds in Medicaid? Sure. Um, in um, the current year, we're working on um, trying to get more of the, the beds stood up in the, the um, community mental health center space and um, trying to uh, deal with the rates to an equivalent basis as transitional housing general. And then um, we're proposing what's in the budget here is to allow for an expansion of transitional housing uh, beds in, in the, the next biennium. Um, we're hoping that we can, those beds, which are uh, currently we have about 60 or so beds that are um, the community mental health centers provides care to Medicaid patients. We're hoping that we can almost double that in the next biennium. Follow up, please. Follow up. So um, the department has has told us that they can't find contractors for the other um, 22 beds that we funded because our rates are too low. Um, so this money you're requesting for rates is that not for the transitional housing beds that we thought we were getting in the current budget? I think it's a, a combination of things. I think the the beds that are sometimes called community residential in the uh, um, in our, our budget, um, that's part of it. And then um, I think um, probably Katja is better to speak to the, to the rest of what is um, trying to be uh, done through the RFP process. But what I'm talking about are those beds that are covered through managed care. Oh, for the waiver. Thank you. Okay, seeing, seeing no more questions, thank you very much. And we'll go on to the Division of Public Health. Okay. And there's quite a few people to come over for this, so I'm sure it'll take a minute. Okay. 
Hello, senators. 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 Hello, Clearly, I, um, I cannot use the phone and the computer at the same time. I apologize for that. Um, good afternoon, Senator Daniels and members of the Senate Finance Committee. I am Lisa Morris. I'm the Director of the Division of Public Health Services. And uh, you may not know that I'm retiring in a few days. Oh, no. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, Patricia Tilly, who uh, many of you know, if not all of you, has been named as interim public health director. Uh, and Shelly Swanson, um, also our health finance director, will be presenting our budget to you. I wanna thank you in my departing words. I wanna thank you for your continued support of the work of public health and I wish you all well. Uh, Trisha, uh, you're on. Well. Well, uh, good afternoon to everyone. And again, thank you for having us here today. Before we get started, I just wanna thank Lisa for all of her guidance along the way. She has helped us stay in financial good shape and has steadied the boat for us. And I hope to be able to continue to provide the um, kind of leadership that she has in the past. So thank you. Um, and I will go ahead and get started. And Shelly is gonna pull up our slides. She's gonna be my co-pilot for today. So thank you, Shelly, if you can do that. that Actually, would Shelly, Shelly, can you stop sharing for one second? I don't think that Deb got quite everyone over and she can't bring them over while we're sharing. So just oh. one second, I don't see. Um, uh, we're missing, we're missing somebody. We're missing Beth Daly. Thank you. Beth, Beth. Daly and, and Ian, if Ian is on board. Oh, I don't think I provided Ian's name, so that. That's okay. <laughs> That's fine. That's great, but we will need yeah. Beth to come over at could, some point. Could, as, you, as could, you re, could you repeat the names of the people who are not there yet? I actually don't see Beth in the audience, so I'm not sure if she was able to make it. I'll check with her. Okay, and I don't see Ian either. So I, I think we are good to go. If, if they are able to join, if they can just text Trish and we can stop sharing and bring them over. Okay, very good. So uh, you can, can go back to sharing your screen. Thank you, Shelley. You can skip to the next slide, that would be great. Super. So I, again, I wanna thank you for having us here today and the opportunity to talk about the work of public health. And you know, I think while all of us are familiar with the incredible efforts of Dr. Chan and Dr. Daly as part of our COVID response, the entire public health team has been working at full tilt to ensure that we meet our mission of protecting, promoting and improving the health of New Hampshire residents, not only from the threats of infectious disease, but they have also been keeping our lab working, our cancer and prevention screening programs running, our food inspectors have been out in the community working hand in hand with our restaurants as they navigated all of those COVID protocols. Our maternal and child health programs, our home visiting programs have been supporting families. You know, children have been getting their routine vaccines. Our data and informatics teams have been creating public dashboards and our emergency preparedness and response teams have been managing millions of pieces of PPE and ensuring that they get to hospitals and nursing homes on time. We can go to the next slide. Um, you know, in this next hour, what I hope to touch on are some of the high points of many of our initiatives and then jump into the details of the budget. I'm going to fly through many of these slides so that we have enough time dedicated to the numbers, but please feel to stop, feel free to stop us and ask questions and, and dig a little bit deeper. We're gonna ask you to keep in mind the broad mission of our work and the essential services that we provide to protect the health of, of all people in our state and in every community. We target evidence-based strategies that we know will improve health. And we try to ensure equitable access to high value, effective and preventative focused healthcare. We collect and analyze data about health status and all with the out ultimate outcome of improving health 
outcomes. So we can skip to the next slide. But as we get down to brass tacks, here are some of the highlights of the division. We've got eight bureaus. We have about 250 staff. We have about 344 current contracts. Our funds mostly come from the federal government, although we have significant number of other funds that come from fees and um, things like our rebates or relationships with our insurers. And our total budget has only about 16% general funds. You can find all of these funds in our 70 accounting units. This is the most of any division in the department. And please note that this does not quite account for the significant investments that we um, understand will be coming and have been coming from the federal government for COVID response. So we can go to the next slide. So what do we do with this investment of federal and general funds? Again, you have, you know the heroic efforts of our COVID response, but Programs like our tobacco prevention and cessation program or programs like lead poisoning don't often make the front, new, front page of the union leader. Programs like home visiting are making real difference in the lives of families and also saving the healthcare system money. And we can see that when we can show that folks that receiving those sorts of services have fewer preterm births. And then we also strategically invest funds to support places like our rural critical access hospitals so that we have more high quality, financially stable services available in every corner of the state. You can switch to the next slide. So we do that through our organizational um, arrangement in our bureaus. Um, and I think you can see that this highlights the diversity of our work. You'll also see that in this next biennium, we have two new bureaus contemplated. The Emergency Services Unit uh, recently moved over from under the Commissioner's Office and has joined us here in public health. The pandemic underscored the need for us to have a stronger and a much more streamlined relationship with emergency preparedness and with our partners at the Department of Safety and, and Homeland Security. Additionally, you will see that the prescription drug pro prescription drug monitoring program is contemplated to join us here in public health. The program, as you likely know, is currently housed within the Office of Professional Licensure. We have worked closely with them for years, um, especially through federal initiatives and federal funding thing, sources like our CDC Opioid Data to Action Program. OPLC and DHHS both believe that DPHS can better integrate this work within a public health framework where it can be aligned with other programs that have a similar portfolio of work. We could better support the registry functions, translate the aggregated data to better inform prevention activities and provide the kind of oversight that we think that the program deserves. Um, and I'm sure we can dig a little bit more into that as, as we move on. We can skip into the next slide. So here we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into some of our bureaus and what they provide. Um, on this slide, you'll see our three of our biggest bureaus, um, infectious disease, population health, and our public health lab. These have the largest budgets and the largest number of DPHS staff. It's here that you'll find the support for our community health centers, family planning, WIC programs, vaccines for children, um, support for individuals with AIDS and HIV and all of our environmental and microbiology lab functions. One of the questions that I heard earlier as I jumped on um, to listen to Henry and Medicaid um, was the question around what proportion of births are paid for by Medicaid. In 2019, so a little bit old data, that was about 26% of all births. Um, it varies by geographic area with some hospitals seeing as high as over 60% of births um, being funded by Medicaid. And that's up in our North country, like in Androscoggin Hospital. And then it goes all the way down to places like Port Portsmouth Regional Hospital that has about 13% of its births supported by Medicaid. Mm -hmm. There were a number of questions that were asked of Medicaid around family planning. Yes. The Title 10 family planning program typically serves around 17,000 individuals a year, supporting preventative health screenings and a full range of contraceptive services. 
individuals pay a sliding a pay according to their ability along a sliding scale or sliding fee scale. We use federal Title X funds and general funds to support about 10 agencies at about 15 different locations around the state. Currently, most of these sites receive general funds and a few receive those federal Title X funds. We anticipate a new federal award coming with new guidelines sometime within the first quarter of state fiscal year 22. So we'll skip on to the next slide. Um, in this section, you can see some of our bureaus. Um, we have uh, health statistics and policy and performance. And these provide the critical infrastructure for the division with everything for planning for our state health improvement plan to performance and quality improvement activities to the oversight and maintenance of systems that move and analyze data. It's within these bureaus that our therapeutic cannabis program lives and other, area, other um, systems, um, uh, systems programs, including rural health and primary care that oversees things such as our state loan repayment program for healthcare providers. The Bureau of Public Health Protection supports the surveillance and investigation of environmental threats, whether they're from food, our food inspectors, or radiation to climate and to lead poisoning. We'll skip on to the next slide. And as noted before, these are our two new bureaus this biennium. So we have our Bureau of Emergency, our Public Health Preparedness, Response and Recovery. Um, this newly organized bureau um, will be having a, a much more holistic approach to both um, response, which is what we do in incredibly well is respond when there's emergency, but really dig deeper into our planning and our preparedness, as well as understanding the work that we're gonna be needing to do in recovery um, as we move forward. You know, So not only right now has this group done an amazing job managing a warehouse of PPE that sometimes looks like Costco, the, the amount, of amount of supplies that have come in and out of that warehouse, um, but we're also preparing to help schools and overnight camps manage testing supplies and uh, for both their symptomatic kiddos so that we can get them to access to um, uh, rapid tests and make sure that they have those for symptomatic kids as well as planning for them of how that they're gonna do their routine surveillance for children, especially as we know that children will not have access to vaccine um, for a little bit of a time now. And then finally, we have our prescription drug monitoring program. The Office of Professional Licensure has been doing a great job um, with this program over many years. We, we all know that there have been lots of changes and evolutions of the program and lots of interest in this area. And we think that by moving it here within public health and embedding it within a public health framework, we can better support with the data functions and also ensuring that we use the information within the program to better support our overall prevention activities. So we'll move on to the next slide. Here, we're gonna take a look at some of the key accomplishments that we've had. You know, public health challenges that are gonna be in front of us over the next biennium are, are pretty complex, uh, but we're prepared to meet them head on as we stand on the foundation of, of many of these achievements. The COVID-19 pandemic, as, as you all know, has strained and stressed almost every part of our lives. But our team was able to work with the National Guard, with Homeland Security, and and most importantly, our community partners to meet the immediate challenge of testing, investigating, contact tracing, and vaccinating. Our population health teams work hand in hand with the Division of Economic and Housing Supports to ensure that, um, th that things like healthcare was accessible, children had access to food, and that families were supported. But as we plan now together for the recovery from the pandemic, we must avoid the temptation to sort of hope for just a return to normal. And instead, I think we're going to lean deeper into transformation and reinvention of what services look like and what we should be planning for in the future. 
The foundation of all of our work rests upon our ability to appropriately plan, both for internal operations and for broader health outcomes, and our ability to integrate our work across the department, across state agencies, and with our community partners. And as we develop our state health assessment and our state health improvement plan, there is no doubt that it will touch on many of these cross-cutting issues from environmental health to adverse childhood experiences to the opioid epidemic that is still out there to the sustainability, support, and equitable access to our healthcare system. So we can go to the next one. As we look, you know, certainly um, our, not only has our infectious disease team been focused on COVID fully, you know, 24-7, um, but we've also done amazing work responding to other threats such as hepatitis A. Our laboratory has stepped up and the volume of work that they've done is just extraordinary in the past year and has really proven the um, success that we have in the work that we have and it's built on the um, expertise of those that are there. And finally, in, in our emergency preparedness, as I said, we have you know, maintained and distributed millions of pieces of PPE and other items in response to COVID. So we can switch, go on to the next slide, please. We've also had success in the past two years improving some health outcomes and improving new and developing new strategies to meet very specific populations. You know, for example, we know that adult smoking rates are down and in part that is due to the work of our tobacco prevention and cessation program and our quit line, but yet our youth vaping numbers have gone up and with increased, you know, so we have been able to then focus and pivot and put in new supports to really meet this new challenge that looks different than the tobacco prevention programs of the past. You know, we've also seen things like with increased supports for things like school and community-based dental programs that the incidence of caries among children have gone down. It's one of those great times where you can see where there are investments, the health outcome go, moves in the direction that we want it to move. We've supported our healthcare system and improved access to care with pandemic support for our critical access hospitals. And finally, I mean, never before have we had, has our data been so transparent so quickly and made available to the public. And that's really been done on the shoulders of our informatics team, um, as well as the relationships that we have with the entire informatics work of the department and, um, do, it, and do it as well. We've also increased, meanwhile, ensured that we had providers in those communities through our state loan repayment program. So we'll move on to the next slide. So those are all great achievements that we've had. There's a million things we could, we could talk about, but meanwhile, we also have some significant challenges in front of us. We are um, structurally, we are continually faced with maintaining and replacing our critical laboratory equipment. We are pushing our data systems to the edge of their capabilities. And like in every corner of the department and state government, our staff are all doing more than one job. And we continue to have challenges in recruiting and retaining highly qualified staff. We continue to see health disparities and health outcomes among different racial and ethnic groups and within economically challenged rural and urban areas of the state. These differences in health outcomes, whether it's maternal morbidity or cancer screening rates or adver adversely affect groups of people who have systematically experienced greater social or economic obstacles based on their racial and ethnic groups, their socioeconomic status, whether they have physical um, disability, and the answer to closing some of these gaps is complex. And it requires a focus not only on the health condition itself or the health behavior, but on some of those other determinants of health. Even our environmental health risks, you know, whether you talk about lead in our older housing stock or 
the threat of contaminants in our water, have solutions that are squarely in the role of public health, but we also need our partners in other sectors and in the community in order to fully address them. The long rate term impacts of the pandemic, whether that's um, from cancer, there are some really outcomes that we're gonna be faced with over the next couple of years, whether that's the outcomes of cancers not caught early enough because people didn't seek screening over the past year, or from the economic and family burdens of women leaving the workforce to care for their young children or their school age children are gonna require us to work with other divisions and within our communities to ensure that our strategies are aligned and effective. But even with these complex challenges, we are hopeful and we are prepared with resources to make improvements. So as we go into the next slide, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about what those resources are and the budget involved in that. And that's where I'm gonna hand it over to, to Karen and, and Shelly to take a look. Um, Shelly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you stop sharing for just a second, perfect. Uh, so Beth Daly is able to join us. That's Beth, D-A-L-Y. And then the other one is Ian Watt. Gonna take a drink because I just stopped really fast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. And Shelly, you can go back to sharing the screen. All right, so uh, this next slide here is uh, just an overview similar to what you've seen in the other division presentations of each uh, bureau's activities. Um, I take full responsibility for the fact that this column did not get updated uh, last week, um, so I do apologize for that. But that is the total request of public health, which is the 2.127 uh, million. To Senator Rosenwald's question earlier, that does not include the $400,000 request because that is an HB2 request, not an HB1 request. And so if I just, um, I'm gonna move right to this slide here, which outlines all, all of what the requests are. And so Trish, if you want to walk through each of them, um, and then we can also talk about the HB2 request for family planning. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, right here, you will see that we have a number of requests that are all within the scope of um, supporting young families um, and uh, prevention services. Much of this work we do in um, collaboration with and really hand in hand with both the Division for Children, Youth and Families and the Division of Economic and Housing Supports. We have had um, an, what we call our early childhood integration team up and running for the past year or so, where we've really tried to determine how we best support those prevention services to keep families sort of safe and healthy and, and um, whole. Um, public health has really focused on serving um, working in the realm of preventing adverse childhood experiences. This, this falls squarely in our shop when we think of what the long-term outcomes are of those adverse childhood experiences, which really are increased uh, chronic disease, uh, increased behavioral health issue, um, complexities, all of which have impacts on our healthcare system. You'll see in here that we have requests for our community collaborations work for Amiscade Health Center to provide some of these integrated family supports and resource navigation. We also have, um, and those supports occur in both Manchester for, with Amiscade, um, way up north to Northern Human Services up in the Northern part of the, in the state and within Lakes Region um, in the central part of the, of the state as well. This has been, um, community collaborations has been incredible opportunity to work directly with um, DCYF 
to really ensure, you know, you think about the front door, you know, we want to keep folks off the front, out of the front door of entering DCYF. I think of these services are really the services that occur way out in the front yard. These are pre truly prevention-based services so that families hopefully never need to go anywhere near the DCYF system. In particular, some of the home visiting programs are really working on expanding services for substance exposed infants. Again, we have worked um, closely with DCYF for years now around things called the plan of safe care, which is um, the plan that gets put together when a pregnant woman comes into care and their, her child might be at risk for being exposed to opioids. And we have done incredible work over the past few years within the community, within our home visiting programs, our family resource centers, and with our prenatal providers um, to get them connected so that families have the support so that moms get into treatment as they need, but that they're also prepared to take care of that infant who's on, on their way and the special needs that those infants might have and to provide the family support needed again before the family is at risk of entering into the child protective system. This is important on lots of levels. One, it's the right thing to do primarily. And two, it's financially the right thing to do. We, we know that the cost is so incredible once we get those families engaged in the child protection system. And then finally, it is the right thing to do because it's, it's the least traumatic thing to do to families to provide voluntary services that are really focused on keeping their family together and provides the parenting education they need and um, the resources and the connections to other supports in the community. So for all of those notions, um, this is the reason why the governor's office is particularly interested in understanding how we might better support these, these preventative services, um, each within our own, whether it's DCYF, whether it's Division of Economic Housing Supports and Public Health, all working in a collaborative way that we can support um, these, these kids and families where they are in their homes. So I'll, I'll leave it, I'll, that's, that's what I have for that section. As um, you know, Karen noted, we also have the additional funds that were requested through HB2 um, for family planning. So that's the other piece of funding that's requested. I would just add one uh, or two notes there. One, the, the references here in parentheses, the 3G and 7G reference back to the document that I presented on Friday in the OCOM presentation. And also community collaboration has also, uh, or I should say last session, last biennium was talked about as the parental assistance programs. So Thank when you, you hear parental assistance, that is also community collaboration. And then I think there's one last slide. Yeah, and so I, I mean, we're just closing out with this notion of that, you know, our priority really is to support prevention and make connections. And we do that with our entire scope of work. Um, but in particular, with the work that we would love to see supported, and, and we're asking for your consideration to be supported so that we can continue what was, again, known as the parental assistance funds in the previous bienniums. Um, to uh, continuing that work within um, the Division of Public Health so we can ensure that families, um, we have the opportunity to prevent those adverse childhood experiences in order to reduce those costs associated with those poor health outcomes in the long run. So thank you. And we're happy to take questions. I'm sure you have several given the speed at which we've just run through the division. Uh, thank you. We'll start with Senator Hennessy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Good to see you, Patricia. Thanks for taking my questions. First, I wanna start with the testing requirements for overnight camps. Have we been able to find funding for the, what in some cases up to three tests per child? Yes, them? yes. So, so thank, thank you for that question, Senator. And yes, we have some federal funds that are enabling us to support those testing. We are working um, with both the camps right now to um, develop a contract so that we will be able to support those, um, the uh, testing as well, um, the preventative. There's a, there's a series for everyone else just to bring you up to speed. There's a requirement for children to have a test um, before they arrive at camp, upon arrival to camp, and then five to seven days later. But we have funds to support that. 
as well as funds to support um, access to Finex Now rapid tests for any um, staff or child that uh, is symptomatic while they're at residential camp. Excellent, thank you. Uh, follow up. Follow up. On page 1221, while I like to think this new program is about me, obviously it's not because I don't know what it means. Um, organization 745, Wise Woman. Can you tell me what that is? Sure. So thank you. I, I'll take a swing at this and then I will ask um, Dr. Tarala to add any more detail um, if she has it. But Wise Woman is a federal program around looking at uh, supporting heart health among women. We, it is a competitive program, competitive uh, federal grant that we've just received from the CDC. And Dr. Tarala, would you like to talk a little bit more about the sort of interventions that we would see to have during through Wise Woman? Sure, thank you so much for the question, Senator. Uh, Wise Woman basically is called Well Integrated Screening and Evaluation for Women Across the Nation. So in short, Wise Woman. Uh, we actually received this uh, three-year grant from CDC and the focus is to reduce the cardiovascular risk uh, among New Hampshire adults, specifically women. And the timing of the grant is really good because we know because with the COVID-19, the impacts and the challenges are high. So we are focusing on very much um, using these funds to focus on those critical populations which, which are impacted by both economic hardship as well as the who are at an increased risk for COVID-19. So we are focusing on using our, our community health center systems to reach out to these hard to reach populations. And we are working actually with our existing programs, our breast and cervical cancer screening programs, uh, and also our diabetes prevention programs so that we could combine some, all of these resources again to focus on how can we reduce diabetes, how can we reduce the obesity and hypertension in these, fam in these uh, adults in New Hampshire. Thank you. And the follow-up, another question? Yes. On page 1191, Rural Health and Primary Care, is this where there's slurp funds? And if so, what lines are they in and what, what is the increase? So I'm, I'm just pulling up that, that right now. And yes, and, and I could have Shelly point to the exact line with the slurp payments in them because we have several um, funding sources, both from general funds and our JUA funds. Um, Shelly, do you wanna to point to the line? Good afternoon. Do you, could you repeat the question, please, Trisha? Sure, we're just looking for where the slurp funds are in on page 1191. They are in class 103. Follow up. Is that entire line, both um, funding sources, general and the, um, I, I forget where the other one is right now. That entire line is just the general funds. The, um, are you, Referencing the JUA funds? Yes. yes. Those are in class 73. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Further questions? Senator Rosenwald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have several. Um, on the family planning, um, Ms. Morris, in March, you told the House that it could be six months to a year before the federal funds were available again. Um, but then on Friday, the department only asked for one quarter's worth. And I think just a little while ago, you said you expect an award in the first quarter. Um, but today we were asked to eliminate the federal funds entirely. Um, so, um, could you please clarify for us when, not just when the award is expected, but when you expect the funds would be available? Yeah, I'll, 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 tr I'll do my best to answer this. So we don't really have a specific date. Uh, the the uh, federal government has not identified exactly when uh, the changes in the Title X uh, will uh, be in place. All they have said to us is it's within the year. 
So uh, we're doing our best to um, understand what that exactly means. Uh, we know that uh, they are moving forward with those changes and they want to get them done as rapidly as possible, but there's a process that they have to go through for that rule change. So um, we, we, we just did our best guesstimate as uh, to when uh, that particular change will take place. Follow up. Follow up. So what happened over the weekend to change the department's request from one quarter's worth of general funds to no general funds and eliminate all the federal funds? So I, I did submit those change requests on uh, Friday and the, the elimination of the 1.6 million in federal is because that shouldn't have been there. It was a mistake that was made in the governor's phase that was my fault. Um, when they removed the general funds, I said that they could be replaced with federal and the federal funds that the agencies would receive would come directly from the federal government. They would not flow through the state. So that was the 1.6 million of federal, 100% federal is incorrectly in the budget at this point. Um, the one quarter is, is an amount that we're hopeful that the rule change will be there um, by October 1st. That is the beginning of the Fed fiscal year. Um, but like Lisa said, we, we don't know for sure. But could I follow up, please? Uh -huh. But now the department's not asking for any general funds. Is that correct? No, it's we're asking for, on ask, well, the change sheet only shows the changes to HB1. The change requests to HB2 uh, are in that, uh, a separate document with the, all of the changes requested to HB2. And that's where that $400,000 request is. We put it in HB2 versus HB1 because it is anticipated that it's more of a one-time expenditure where that rule change is anticipated. And if I could follow up on my question that I asked earlier about uh, Title 10 federal funds that might be impacted. Um, and it was suggested I asked during this part of the presentation, what it, what are the potential risks uh, to federal Title X funds from the current provisions in House Bill 2? So I'll take that. We don't, um, under the current Title X regulations, HB2 does not have an impact on our Title X funded programs. Um, it may impact those uh, other family programs that receive only general funds, but um, HB2 does not have an impact on our um, ability to accept those federal funds. I'm sorry, my question was not about current regulation, but expected changes to federal regulation. Yes, and, and I will um, ask Dr. Trella to, to correct me if I'm incorrect on there, but what we anticipate to be changes at the federal level, um, HB2, will we will still be allowed to accept those federal funds. What it will impact is some of the agencies that will choose to contract with the department. Thank Dr. You. Trella, would you like to add any clarity to that? No, what you said, Trisha, is accurate. It's just that it'll impact our contracting process with any of the agencies who want to access these funds. And in turn, that might impact our family planning services and the, the people who depend on those services. Again, we can accept the fund. We, it is likely that we'll be able to accept those funds. It may be that our partners in the community may not want to accept the requirements of HB2. Thank you. And a further question. Oh. Um, does the department um, see value in having community health workers in the regional public health offices and what was their impact during the pandemic so far? Thank you, Senator, that's a great question. Um, so we have come to depend on community health workers within many of our federally qualified health centers um, and they have been instrumental in reaching out to populations that are harder to reach, whether those are racial and ethnic populations or rural populations. And um, we do see value in adding community health workers into our public health regions. 
Uh, the good news is, is that we anticipate federal funds um, to allow us to place additional community health workers within those communities, um, additional health workers, both within community health workers within our FQHCs, um, as well as within our public health networks to help us uh, on this road through recovery. Um, we anticipate we're gonna continue to need, especially um, work um, in hard to reach areas um, to address vaccine hesitancy. Um, and we think that they're an excellent strategy and, and really have proven their benefit um, with other health conditions. We, we currently use community health workers right now to help us with our breast and cervical cancer program. And um, the community health, the role of the community health worker is not fully unlike the role of some of our home visitors with our young, younger families. So um, it's something that we strongly support. Thank you. Any further questions? So with all, with all the uh, programs that you have, how would one determine whether you're being successful or not? That's a, thank you for that question, Senator. Um, each of our programs have um, performance metrics attached to them. So um, many of which are somewhat determined by our federal contracts. Again, we are mostly federally funded. So often our CDC funds or other funds, uh, whether it's from HRSA or USD, DA have uh, metrics that we must achieve and we measure them um, through performance improvement. Um, so individually, we look at that. So they could be everything from sort of per, um, basic, you know, are we hitting the numbers of people that we should sort of process measures as well as outcomes? Are we actually seeing a reduction in um, or increase in a particular health outcome or a particular health behavior? So you know, in tobacco, that looks like whether or not we're seeing a reduction in tobacco use or whether um, uh, either or vaping use among our youth. Um, in our cancer programs, it looks like attaining sc certain screening um, uh, quotas are, are getting up to certain outcomes along the way. Our laboratory has an incredible quality assurance program and ensure that they're providing the kind of care or kind of services that they, they need to and that they're meeting all of the appropriate standards. So it's hard to have just one. The, and I'll, I'll follow up by just saying that this is where our new state health assessment and our state health improvement plan is gonna provide new objectives for us to reach to ensure that we're really improving the health of our state. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, uh, thank you very much. And uh, Lisa, thank you for your service and I wish you well going forward. Thank you, Senator Daniels. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Public Health. Thank you. Behavioral health is up next. Yeah, well, can it take a minute to get everyone in? Karen, I think um, I think that we have everyone here. Okay, you're good to go. Okay, so we'll recognize uh, whoever's going to be doing doing the presentation. Yes, thank you, um, Senator Daniels, Chair uh, Daniels, and members of the committee. 
I just want to get to a slideshow so you don't have to see all the other busy stuff that's happening. Um, there we go. That's much better than you seeing people trying to prompt me of what to say during the middle of the presentation. Um, so for the record, I am Katya Fox. I'm the director of the Division for Behavioral Health. And I have my team here at the ready um, should they need to respond um, to any questions that you may have. So looking at the mission, this is the same mission that uh, Commissioner Shibonet shared on Friday. Um, and what I want to do is I want to speak just for a few minutes and go through our slides. But I know that there have been a number of questions that have come up both on Friday, um, earlier today, and in general as we look at building our new systems. So our scope, focus, and approach um, is really guided by these three documents. We're very fortunate to be able to have these to uh, be our guides and to really lead the work of the division. Um, it's very helpful when we get bogged down and lost in the minutia and the details, but this was um, really helpful and helped frame the work of our division. And our division is community-based, so it's all the community-based services for the mental health system as well as the substance misuse system. And um, we work very closely uh, with the 24-7 facilities, which you'll hear from right after this presentation. So in 2019, there was the establishment of the 10-year mental health plan. We have the system of care, which has been in place for a number of years, but has really been amplified and uh, supported um, through significant funding in the last few years. And then the Governor's Commission on Alcohol and Other Drugs has a strategic plan. And since we are the fiscal agent, so to speak, and we administer that um, work of the Governor's Commission, um, I thought it was important to include that because we braid our funding with the Governor's Commission funding uh, to make sure that we have this comprehensive system of care and continuum of care. So I'm gonna use some keywords that um, each of these plans have, and they include access for individuals and families to the full continuum of care, prevention and early intervention, uh, crisis services, outpatient services, inpatient services, child-focused strategies, and the integration of physical health co-occurring um, disorders, how we address those, um, that this is evidence-infused, evidence-based practices and programs that we've implemented. We have families, youth, and peers as um, full participants and have their voices amplified throughout the processes of developing programs. There is the addressing and um, following Trish Tilly and talking about the social determinants of health. That's a really important aspect of our work. And um, with specifically looking at when we are talking about outcomes, um, we really wanna look at reducing um, misuse of substances um, throughout our system and across um, the population spectrum. So you'll see our nice little uh, circle here and you'll see some uh, themes here when we look at um, the graphics that we've developed because we think it simplifies um, the, all of the components that make up these three plans. So starting with the Bureau for Children's Behavioral Health, it was created five years ago. It is responsible for and has done an amazing job developing the system of children's behavioral health services. And again, addressing all ages, which means up to age 21, and at all levels of care. It offers programs that support and treat the child, youth, young adults, and importantly, their families. It aligns with the system of care values. And right now we have four major provider groups 
um, first and foremost, the 10 community mental health centers. Um, and I, I would be remiss um, if I didn't recognize, not only do we have an amazing staff of, I believe we have 49 positions um, that are, um, that are were presented on Friday, um, but we also have our community mental health centers, which have done a huge amount of work throughout um, pre-pandemic and during the pandemic and have really been great partners over the years. And they're really the bedrock of the work that we do um, for community mental health. There uh, in children's services, we have uh, 12 residential treatment providers, two care management entities, and one acute psychiatric hospital. Um, and that um, is referring to Hampstead at this point. And we're looking, um, as you know, for the system of care, expanding services and supports to address service gaps. And we'll go into more about that um, here, um, but also in responding to questions. So again, this is just a neat graphic um, that a member of our team was able to pull together. Um, and that um, really is the um, something that Erica Unger really wanted and needed to convey to all of our stakeholders about what we're doing. So we're talking about screening, assessment, and treatment, community-based, intensive home and community-based service and supports. And you can see the bullets below of how those are carried out. Residential treatment, and then the psychiatric hospitalization. At the bottom, and this is foundational, is statewide mobile crisis. Looking at the Bureau of Mental Health Services, um, again, this repeats a lot of what we've talked about and think about, it's specific uh, to adults. And so this particular Bureau is providing oversight, guidance, technical assistance, training, and um, monitoring the mental health providers statewide. And again, ensuring the full continuum of recovery-oriented uh, mental health services, then that they're available. Again, looking at a graphic, I think we all heard the press release um, or the, in the press the last couple of weeks about you need to dial 603 now <laughs> um, before you call a local number in the state of New Hampshire because that is um, important for the implementation of 988. What is 988? 988 is the um, national three-digit number that's been uh, established by the FCC to uh, be responsive to uh, what is known as the suicide national hotline. Um, but it is actually gonna be much more than that. It is an emergency line. It is an, inter an opportunity for interventions to happen. The state received a planning grant um, for this and we're partnering with our current uh, provider, which is Headrest. Um, in Lebanon, in we are working with the Department of Safety and other uh, community level partners uh, to implement 988. It is a federal requirement, and we um, are, oh, I should say the date of this, it's effective July 1st, 2022. So, um, we, in the meantime, we had already envisioned as a result of the 10-year plan is the 24-7 crisis call center that is currently under procurement. Um, that's a so-called portal as called out in the 10-year plan. And the idea is to have this one entity that then deploys the regional services, which we are currently working with our community mental health centers that will be delivering those services in their regions. So right now, as you can see, we have multiple numbers, we have um, multiple teams um, that are somewhat siloed. Um, and what we wanna see is one statewide number and that an emergency response is not about hospitals, it's not about police, and it's not about um, any one entity, it's about community and um, reaching people where they are. 
And that um, goes into the second part of the, about the mobile outreach. So rather than having someone come to an emergency room and wait and uh, for a bed somewhere or wait for some types of services, the vision is for us to go to them. And um, again, crisis stabilization, looking at that, we have um, stood up um, a number of services and we'll continue to do that um, so that people have the opportunity to stay in their community um, and not end up at the highest acute end of care. And then lastly, our Bureau of Drug and Alcohol Services. So um, BDAS, which it's affectionately known as, um, does a number of things. Prevention is something that's often overlooked, but I think that as you saw in public health presentation, prevention is key and we work with um, the regional public health networks on that piece. We do surveillance, crisis intervention, increase awareness of and access to treatment. And in, something that many people don't know is we do the um, oversee the impaired driving services um, and that is paid for and supported by the participants. And then we re, uh, support recovery community organizations, which are the peer um, supports that are available that you hear a lot about. And that's done through our facilitating organization um, which oversees, I think, we're up to 16 of those centers across the state. And then we also, through our partners, do training and technical assistance for providers. So challenges, rather than put um, the financial pieces in here, I just thought I'd remind everybody because it's not as if you have heard it before. I'm joking. Um, we have workforce shortages across all provider types. And so when we are saying to ourselves or saying to each other, why haven't these services been stood up? This is one of the major challenges that our providers have. We have um, the housing market and housing availability in able to safely uh, support individuals in their communities. And that is going to be uh, a struggle. We do work with the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority the Community Development Finance Authority, and with the newly established Council on Housing Stability um, to address this issue, knowing that if but for um, housing, um, that, we, that we would be able to transition individuals from New Hampshire Hospital into the community if these uh, supports were available. This next one, transformation versus expansion. So we have um, really decided and taken to heart the input and the plans that were established and the expectations that our families and individuals have for the 10-year plan system of care um, that we want to transform the system. The current system helps thousands of people across our state, but it also um, there are many who are not able to be uh, served by the current model. We want to make sure that we're moving forward, that we're being responsive and being transformative versus asking everybody to do a little bit more or a lot more or incrementally more. And so when we get asked often, why hasn't this happened yet? Um, it's because it's very complex. It's really hard and it takes time. And so um, the last one is obvious that we're addressing urgent needs. Um, the pandemic only uh, magnified that um, while standing up these transformative uh, programs and systems. Um, Karen, do we wanna go through the budget stuff first or should I address some of the areas that came up earlier? Um, I would go ahead and address some of the earlier areas. Okay. Um, so I may need to be prompted to um, answer um, some of the questions. Some of it's financial. So I will first address um, Senator Rosenwald's question that she asked of Henry about the $5 million um, versus the money that is being requested by uh, Medicaid for rates. 
So the $5 million was very specific in HB4. And that had, so with that language came that we would use it for a specific purpose. And so the bulk of it or more than half of it was used to stand up the PATH program, um, which Heather Malkin will talk a little bit more about. I'm sure you've heard about the transitional housing that we have established. And we added a couple more beds with um, a existing provider. And that amount that remains is just under $2 million. We are not able by statute or by session law or whatever you call <laughs> HB4 um, by that language able to um, use those funds for any other purpose. And so we do expect those funds to lapse. The um, discussion, and um, I'm glad that it did come up in Henry's presentation from Medicaid about the money being requested for rates. One of the areas, um, so I will say with that housing, uh, supportive housing funds, we did put out a procurement and we received no applications. We had to cancel the um, procurement so that we were able to talk to our community partners about why they did not um, bid uh, for those supportive housing beds. And we heard that the rates were too low and it wasn't viable um, to stand up these services for the community mental health centers. So we have 60 existing beds as Henry had indicated and we wanna to expand to an additional 60 beds. But in order to do that, we heard loud and clear that we need to raise those rates. And by raising those rates, we mean to the level that we already provide for transitional housing um, through our um, partnership right now, our only provider is NFI. Um, which operates transitional housing in three parts of the state and soon to be five parts of the state through um, contract expansion uh, or through, um, yes, through, through bed expansion. So that's why um, those funds are needed in Medicaid uh, to raise those rates and be more successful in our procurement processes. So with that, I, I think Karen, I'll turn it over to you I, and I'll go through my notes in the meantime. Yeah. I'm, I was on mute. Uh, so this slide here is uh, an overview of the behavioral health budget similar to other presentations. And uh, the last column there is the total requested changes as you changes are in children's behavioral health and mental health services. And Katia, if you want to go to the next slide. And I'll, I'll lean on Katia to, um, oh, you went ahead too. Back one. I'll lean on Katia to uh, describe each of these in detail. Uh, but the first request here, which is in 15A, is additional funds from DOE. Those are funds that um, were budgeted or anticipated in our federal funds that um, are part of a grant that DOE um, has and um, that we needed to account for. And then there are two requests, the first one here being 4N, both related to mobile crisis, one at the adult level and one at the children's level, uh, where an increase is needed in fiscal year 23. And the, and the second one to that is 5N, which is the second block there, which there are also funds in fiscal year 22. Yes, and so what we did was um, we have done an incredible amount of work on the financing of the mobile crisis response system. And so when, we, um, when the rubber met the road, um, we got the information from our actuary about two weeks ago um, because we really truly believed that uh, mobile crisis could be significantly supported with Medicaid billable funds. We worked with Milliman, the actuary with Medicaid, and um, spent hours and hours and hours going through what can be billed and what is not billable. And it came to be that we needed to include additional 
general funds to be able to support the services. And so there are many um, non-Medicaid billable services that are provided by these teams. And we believe in order to really do um, the job that we are asked to do and to have the system that I showed earlier, we need this additional funding. I will say that most of it appears in state fiscal year 23. That is contingent upon incorporating the provisions of SB 157 that the Senate laid on the table, presumably because it was a budget issue. And that is having the state fiscal year 2021 funds um, from children's behavioral health not lapse until the end of the next fiscal year 22. If we were not to have that um, be part of the budget, then we would be requesting another $3 million. And to uh, preempt a question there, probably uh, with regards to that Senate bill, if that did pass, that does not change any of our lapse estimates. The first uh, one here on this page, 16A, is similar to the earlier one with a, a grant from DOE. Uh, Katya just um, discussed the second one, 5N. The third one is funding for mental health stabilization. Yes, that was funding that actually back way back when, when we were putting together the budget, um, I believe it was well over, well, it was about a year ago, um, we were looking at um, significant instability in the state budget due to the pandemic and the revenues that were, um, un, uh, were expected to take a huge dip and stay there. Um, and so we had to put something on the table um, as we we're going through the governor's phase and the agency request and so we removed $1.5 million from uh, the budget um, and that's currently supporting services and we put it on the table. We now know that the revenues were in a whole different um, situation and we know that the stabilization services are needed now more than ever due to the pandemic and what families and individuals are experiencing. So we're requesting that that be added to the budget. And you'll note that that is 6G, which indicates that it was a request that the governor made of the house to be added to the budget. The next one, 6N, is a very small request, uh, only $30,000, uh, but it is to fund additional guardianship slots, which we are required to uh, maintain um, and do have additional slots that have been already created and we need to continue to fund. Anything to add on that, Katya? No, I think that covers it. Okay, and the last one is a grant that we just received an award for um, that we uh, likely won't spend any of this fiscal year. So we are asking to budget it for 22 um, when we anticipate spending it. And that uh, additional funding came through um, for specifically for um, addressing pan the pandemic related issues. It came through the federal budget. Um, it's a one, we expect a one-time boost in our mental health block grant, which it actually is almost, almost double. I think it's about double um, what our current uh, mental health block grant is. And we have certain set-asides that are required as part of the block grant um, that are maintained including for our first episode psychoses and for uh, crisis response. We are pegging um, some of these funds or majority of the funds over $2 million um, over the biennium, so about a million dollars a year for what Commissioner Shubinat described and the um, team at Alvarez and Marcel described on Friday, which is for critical time intervention which is that transition of care from the institutional setting, for example, uh, New Hampshire Hospital and designated receiving facilities so that we have one person providing care coordination for nine months after someone um, is uh, discharged from those acute settings and will allow them to integrate into the community and um, really is not a gap that is not addressed in all of these other efforts that we have described. 
And with that, I think, Mr. Chair, we're ready for questions. Well, thank you. And Senator Hennessy is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Katja, for taking my questions. I have three right now for you. The first one, you mentioned that NFI currently has three locations for transitional beds, but there'll be five soon. Where are those two additional locations? So I can um, affirm that one of them is in Manchester. Um, the other is still under development. They're required to get approval from the department for the next location. And I know that they're in a highly competitive bidding uh, process for this particular area. And so um, it's probably uh, not good for me to disclose where they're hoping to be for the uh, fifth location. Do we have any locations north of Concord? We do. We have beds in Bethlehem. Thank you. And for the mobile health, health crisis teams, do we have any data yet that shows that these teams are able to help those experience a mental health crisis and keep them out of the hospitals? We do. We have three teams currently under our community mental health agreement, the so-called Amanda D settlement, which is our uh, federal case that we um, settled with the plaintiffs. And those three teams are in Nashua, Manchester, and Concord. And we have data that is submitted to us monthly about those interventions and how many uh, hospitalizations were prevented. And we'd be happy to share that with you. Thank you. Uh, and finally, on page 1297, I'm looking at the state opioid response grant. Can you tell me, it looks like the grant was about 16 and a half million in 20, nothing in 21, but goes up significantly to about 25 in 22. What is the reason why we didn't get it in 21 and what, were, what weren't we able to do with this grant when we didn't have it? So one of the unfortunate limitations of, uh, of the budget is that we start preparing it in July of last year, so almost a year ago. And at that time, we had not yet received the grant award and we um, had not accepted any additional funds. We did receive that grant award in September, October timeframe. And we went to fiscal committee subsequent to that and did accept it. So there were grant funds in fiscal year 21. They just are not reflected here. And, they, and that's um, for a federal fiscal year, it's about $28 million per year. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Senator Rosenwald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on the transitional housing, you may have answered this, but I couldn't hear it. How much of the $5 million remains? Could the department come to fiscal and request to transfer it to rates? And if, if that doesn't happen, will it lapse? So Senator Rosenwald, um, yes, um, we have uh, accounted for $3 million through the PATH program, um, and then a couple of additional beds through NFI, and we have just under $2 million remaining. HB4 was very specific in its appropriation of this fund uh, funding, and so without um, a change to that specific language in HB4, we cannot use it for any other purpose and transfer it is my understanding from finance and legal. Um, and so therefore it will lapse. And will it lapse? Yes. Yes. Um, and um, further question, please. Follow up. Thank you. What is the status of the children's mobile crisis unit that was funded in HB uh, in the current biennium? So Senator Rosenwald, as we are going through, I was um, explaining a little bit about um, the, uh, the mobile crisis and what we decided to do was to have integrated because we have the 10 year plan, because we have um, the system of care, we're integrating mental health for uh, mobile response into a rehaul and transformation of our emergency response system to really focus on the community um, and that response. And so we have graded funding from the state, state opioid response grant from the system of care 
uh, very specific children's um, response, uh, mobile response, and from the um, adult mental health services, we're combining those funds to have a comprehensive community response rather than standing up a separate children's response um, or, and have a concurrent adult response. We want to garner those resources. We are currently um, working with our selected vendor to bring a contract before a governor and council. Um, it is likely to be in June for the portal, the so-called statewide hub, um, and that is the call center. And then the community mental health centers, we um, have our annual contracts with them that we're currently working with them specifically to stand up those regional teams. That is they're asking for the additional funding um, because we did go through that process with Milliman, our actuary, uh, to determine what was Medicaid billable and what was not, and um, discovered that we needed additional general funds for the non-Medicaid billable services. Follow, oh, please. Will that, how much of that funding will the department be lapsing? We hope that there is no funding that's being lapsed um, as called for in SB 157, which the Senate um, passed 24-7, I mean 24-0. Um, I didn't, sorry, I didn't mean to expand the Senate uh, <laughs> population. Where are those new districts? Um, <laughs> um, in that, so it, it passed um, that bill that would take the funding um, we've already lapsed funding because in children's behavioral health, um, there is not, there wasn't a non-lapsing language between the two fiscal years in the biennium. So tw uh, 20 is already, um, already lapsed. For 21, SB 157 requested that those funds be carried forward and not lapse and be part of um, state fiscal year 22. Um, and the, therefore that funding would help support um, the children's services that are envisioned in the system of care. Just final follow-up. Follow up. um, I believe Senate Bill 157 is on the table. Yes. Um, has the department requested that the language of it be added to House Bill 2? We, we did not. I, uh, yeah. We did not. What I would mention is in that document that has all of the language requests, there is a request for an HB1 footnote to at least make it non-lapsing between 22 and 23. Thank you. So I haven't had an opportunity to talk to Karen about this because as, as I was going through everything in preparation for this afternoon, we may have a forthcoming request um, about that, knowing that um, we're pretty late in the process, um, unless that Senate bill comes off the table. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Further questions? If the, cha the requested changes to the House budget were approved, how, uh, how many positions would be filled because of those requests? So we... Hmm. Karen, is this reference the back of the budget um, reduction or just the current positions? I don't, I don't think any of our requests are regarding any positions. They're okay. all programmatic dollars. Okay, thank you. I think we just are converting um, three temporary positions that were for children's behavioral health that were earmarked but not created in the last budget. And so we're just converting those to permanent positions that are already filled. Okay, right. But those you. are not part of our change request. Those are already built into the budget. Okay. Uh, throughout our pre presentations, we have heard that there have been increases in substance abuse, behavioral health, mental health. Uh, could you ex please explain uh, your prevention program and why these numbers are rising as opposed to falling? So oh, we have um, noted this, all of our statistics indicate this. It was predicted um, early in the pandemic when we started seeing some of the early signs um, of a distressed um, community. And so with the liquor sales increase, we saw 
um, the children's situation as evidenced by the emergency department demand um, for in the um, inpatient bed demand. And so we um, know that we're not alone. We know it's across the country. Every single day I get invited to another webinar or see another uh, issue brief about what's been happening to the community. We um, believe that there, there are a number of factors and those include, especially at the children's level, um, the lack of structure and not having um, school-based systems and being um, available and being in school in person. We saw that play out a little bit in the division for children, youth and families. Um, and we also um, know that a pandemic, I mean, we've never experienced this in our lifetimes, or at least I haven't, and I'm, I'm in my mid fifties. Um, so as a result, we're seeing some stress that we didn't see before. Um, people who have never experienced the types of um, areas that we cover, which include mental health and substance misuse, um, have entered into that, or it has exasperated a situation that they had under control and that they were managing. So they were successfully managing themselves um, without any intervention, yet it's now reached a crisis point because of the stressors caused by the pandemic. We also know that um, just looking at the population, uh, again, um, seeing the information from uh, the children's uh, services is that there's an increase from individuals who are commercially insured. So typically we serve the Medicaid population. That's the majority of the business that we do, so to speak. Um, but we're seeing a lot more people across all socioeconomics who are now accessing public services. Okay. Thank you. Now, um, how about prior to the pandemic? I mean, it seems you these numbers uh, continue and, and we continue to appropriate more and more money to try to handle an end result, but I'm kind of wondering what, what the plan is for trying to address it. As your commissioner says, uh, your, your goal is to prevent a crisis. So what are we doing to try to get that done and what, what's not working? Absolutely, we always have that balance of investing in prevention, which is for the long-term and dealing with our um, emergency acute situation that's right before us. Um, we always are working in two-year cycles because of our budget and in our contracting and our whole system seems to be built around small increments um, of time. We need to really dig deep um, into the prevention aspect and that's why it's so important with what Trish Tilly was talking about, about the population health approach and about the investment in prevention. We were fortunate in the last biennium to have um, additional funding through the uh, Governor's Commission on Alcohol and Other Drugs that increased to $10 million a year. And the first thing out of the gate that that commission did was um, have an investment in prevention services. We hope that throughout this, um, any stress in the system that we keep in mind and we really look at those prevention efforts because without them, we're gonna always be in this cycle. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Have a great day. You too. At this time, the committee will be in recess for 15 minutes. That, that that's me on Wednesday, I think. So that that's me on Wednesday.
Senator Reagan, how are you?
is a uh, couple of quick, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. quick calculations on the public hearing and testifying. Mm -hmm. Right now we have 150 um, signs yes, that are I've got a copy of so Yeah, if you give, if you give right. them three minutes. I'm sorry. That's 450. Yeah, I don't know why or how. But that would be about know, just um, eight and a half hours of testimony. It's very helpful. <laughs> so, what's the split on that? One um, o'clock versus one six? Class, one o'clock is more than six. <clears throat> okay. Um, and it looks like right now we probably, we probably have about a half hour from, from the afternoon to start with at six o'clock. Um, Half an hour what? Half an hour of testimony from the afternoon that we won't get to. Oh, got it. Yeah. So, um, well, two minutes. <laughs> so I, I, I have the ethics staff that I have. I can I can use people as timekeepers okay. for three minutes. Okay. <clears throat> oh, and um, Senator Deidre Cobb, who has some things um, that has come up with his family and he's had to get off. Okay. He won't be back. May the committee will please come back to order. And we will recognize the next presentation, the New Hampshire Hospital. Heather, are you doing this? I am, thank you. Good afternoon, can you hear me okay? We can. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Uh, Joe Christie, I think is gonna post a slideshow that we'll go through. And thank you for your time. So again, this, this presentation will be focused around the 24 seven care facilities um, that I work with. And that includes uh, New Hampshire Hospital, Glencliff. Um, and in addition to that, a little bit about Hampstead and our contract with Hampstead. So this slide talks a little bit about, you know, really just the flow for a patient. Um, through the healthcare system from the emergency room to New Hampshire Hospital, and then various discharge locations from um, home, first and foremost, but also group homes, transitional housing, nursing homes, Glencliff Home, and our PATH Center. The mission for New Hampshire Hospital is to help citizens with acute mental illness stabilize their conditions and to live their best lives. Our vision is that our hospital will become a model of inpatient psychiatric care in the state and the region using standardized evidence-based methods to stabilize symptoms and prepare patients to thrive in their home community. 
We are an employer of choice who supports our staff's individual safety, wellness, growth, and engagement by fostering high functioning teams. At Glencliff Home, the mission is to provide a continuum of service to New Hampshire's developmentally disabled and or mentally ill population in a home-like atmosphere with an emphasis on independence, dignity, and acceptance. The vision at Glencliff Home is that their residents live a full life and gain independence by overcoming their challenges and developing skills that ultimately move them into their preferred community. The PATH Center is our transitional housing um, center at the Philbrook Building. And the mission there is to demonstrate care and compassion for citizens with mental illness by aiding them and in integrating them back to their community whilst offering the least restrictive environment possible. The vision at PATH is that they will become a, a model cell of community integration for citizens with mental illness across the state of New Hampshire and the country at large improving the progression of individuals from an acute care setting to community living. So our populations are listed here. Um, so you have New Hampshire Hospital, Glen Glencliff Home, the PATH Center, and then we also listed Hampstead Hospital, um, our contracted hospital for child acute psychiatric services. I'd like to bring your, sorry, if you want to go back, Joe, sorry, one second. A lot of people ask about maximum sen, uh, census. And if you look on the right column there, you can see New Hampshire Hospital at 75, Glencliff at 120, PATH at 16, and then the 45 youth beds at Hampstead Hospital. There is slight variation in that day-to-day -day depending on what patients may need. And sometimes when there is single occupancy need for a room. So this list just really, again, populations that we serve. And although the 24 seven facilities serve a finite number of patients, our impact on the community across the state is immeasurable. This slide just demonstrates really the specialty service that we provide in all of these settings. In the green are some of our more common psychiatric diagnoses that we treat, but there are also a number of medical conditions that require treatment in our centers. This slide describes the scope in each one of these facilities, which is a little bit different or a lot different from, from the other. So at New Hampshire Hospital, we provide acute inpatient psychiatric care for geriatric, forensic, and adult patients. Uh, there's also a medical care provision here at the hospital. We have a medical department that manages um, medical comorbidity issues. At Glencliff Home, that's a long-term psychiatric uh, nursing home essentially that provides care for the mentally ill and disabled citizens. And they also provide a medical component in their center. At PATH, we provide transitional housing and aggressive case management to help clients transition back to their preferred community and ultimately independent housing. And then at Hampstead, our contracted hospital, they provide acute inpatient psychiatric care for kids. Challenges for New Hampshire Hospital. I don't think any of this is new information um, for your committee, but we have the front door um, issue with the, with the need and the boarding noted in the emergency department, both for kids and adults. We have our backdoor discharge challenges with uh, capacity to discharge to group homes, transitional housing, long-term care, um, and capacity to discharge forensic patients to a more appropriate setting. Operationally and financially, recruitment and retention are more challenging than ever. Forensic and housing of uh, House of Corrections admissions can be challenging. We do have aging furniture and an aging building. It can be challenging contracting with commercial insurance carriers. And then we have the financial challenge of reductions in our dish payments. Challenges at Glencliff Home. Again, front door, there's a long wait list at Glencliff um, and a significant increase in referrals for patients who have uh, co-occurring dementia. The backdoor issue at Glencliff is similar to New Hampshire Hospital in that it's difficult to find um, ex affordable housing in the community and a lack of support staff. So for a lot of the patients at Glencliff, um, 
the staff are working with them to discharge them to the community, but it's difficult to um, deal with workforce shortages, frankly, um, and get them the staff that they need for in-home supports. Operationally, recruitment and retention is a huge issue at Glencliff. Um, again, due to the nursing shortage and the remote location in the North Country, they also have aging furniture and an aging uh, building. At the PATH Center, these are a couple of um, just challenges, but also I would like to think of them as goals, really, um, more than challenges. Right now, in the short term, uh, the PATH program is working to build relationships with the community at large, um, expanding community knowledge of the facility and what their mission is, and standardizing the referral process and criteria for a patient to um, come to the PATH program long term. Ultimately, we want to be a model that can be replicated throughout the state. So the budget summary. I'm going to hand over this portion to Joe Christie, our CFO. Good afternoon, um, uh, Senators, and thank you for the time today. Um, so much like uh, other divisions, this slide summarizes the various uh, accounting units and activity codes associated with uh, Agency 94, which is New Hampshire Hospital and the PATH Center. Um, we do have some change requests uh, indicated, so they're totaled here. Um, and if I just go to the next slide here, um, these change re uh, requests are summarized here. There's uh, a few for your consideration. Uh, the first of which is a contract for a high volume nursing recruitment uh, organization. These are companies that specialize in uh, large scale nursing recruitment. Um, we, we felt that this would be uh, important in this upcoming biennium uh, as we look to expand capacity at New Hampshire Hospital on the former children's unit. We're gonna need additional staffing, uh, particularly in, in nursing staffing. Um, what really prompted us to think of this idea was we executed a similar contract in uh, this past December for mental health workers, which is a, uh, a non-licensed role. Um, and that contract actually yielded over 25 uh, uh, individuals in uh, a 30 day period. So uh, very, very successful uh, contract thus far. Um, and so we're hoping to replicate that uh, for, for nursing as well. Um, we do have one position transfer coming from uh, the division of um, the office of the commissioner. Um, and so that's reflected here uh, and there should be a corresponding uh, a change in the OCOM uh, uh, budget as well. Um, we informed the house that there was an, a pending change to disproportionate share hospital payments or DISH um, coming from a federal level. They changed the definition in how uncompensated care is calculated and treated in the DISH program. Uh, and so we were anticipating a multi-million dollar revenue uh, shortfall because of these upcoming changes. We have since uh, gained some additional clarity and we were also able to increase our dish rates. So while the change in federal law would reduce our revenues, our dish rates are actually going to help offset that loss. And so as a result in fiscal year 22, uh, we actually anticipate needing less general funds because of the increase in the dish rates will we'll, um, more than compensate for the change in federal law. And then in fiscal year 23, uh, the opposite will occur where the, the change in federal law will, um, will outweigh the, the increase in dish rates and therefore we will need uh, some additional general funds in fiscal year 23. Uh, and the last change request we have here, um, so this is my first uh, budget cycle within the state. Um, and I did not realize we do not need to budget for non-lapsing classes. So uh, the hospital inadvertently budgeted for um, the Hampstead contract. Uh, some of you may remember uh, House Bill 4 from last biennium appropriated $5 million for the um, operation of a uh, children's psychiatric facility. That $5 million was used for the Hampstead contract. And it will carry us to really just shy of a couple of months uh, through the next biennium. And so um, we are reducing our budget by that appropriate general fund, general fund amount in, in both uh, years of the biennium. That was for New Hampshire Hospital and PATH. Um, and then for Glencliff, again, this is a summary of uh, their activity codes and their budget lines. Uh, and for Glencliff Home, we are not requesting any additional changes to our budget at this point. And I think with that, we'll take any questions. 
Senator Hennessy has a question. Thank you. And this question is for Joe on um, two questions, actually. One, the request 18A, what division is that position coming from or activity code number? Um, that is from the Office of Commissioner, I believe. Karen, would you be able to articulate uh, what activity code that position was in? Yes, so it's the Office of Business Operations 5676 is the accounting unit uh, that that was previously in. Um, so finance is consolidated with the exception of New Hampshire Hospital. And we had one position that was reporting to uh, the deputy CFO of the department that uh, we've moved over to New Hampshire Hospital. She does still support some department-wide operations as well, um, but her primary work is now going to be at the hospital. So does, does this adjustment need to be taken out of 5676 as well? Yes, and there okay. is a corresponding change request for that as well. Okay, and then follow on eight, uh, 8750 on request 8N for the high volume nursing recruitment, the $1.9 million a year, how many nurses do you expect to hire for, for each of those years? Uh, so that um, estimate was based off of a contract, um, I believe, that was a budgetary figure provided by a vendor. I believe we discussed 35 FTEs. And follow up? Follow up. That's just for the agency, right? That's not for the actual salaries and benefits for the employees, right? Correct, correct. So the, the intent of this would be that they are permanent placements. So they would be state of New Hampshire employees, um, but, but this is a, a firm that would help us do kind of uh, wide scale nursing recruitment um, I should also mention too that a, a good portion of this would likely be recruitment for out-of-state nurses, which would help build the psychiatric nursing workforce in the state of New Hampshire. And final question, is that um, 35 per year or is that 35 in the biennium? Uh, that would be 35 um, in the biennium. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Further questions? Um, <clears throat> I have one uh, going, going back to the uh, four or facilities that you have, do, do residents transfer from one to another or do, are they just from the public to a particular facility and then back to the public? So thank you for the question. So we do have patients that transfer in between the, the facilities with the exception of Hampstead normally. When we enacted the Hampstead contract, we did stop child admissions here. At New Hampshire Hospital, we have temporarily begun that again, just to offset the wait list for kids. Um, but otherwise from New Hampshire Hospital, we discharge to Glencliff, um, we discharge to the PATH Center. And, and at times, if patients become acute, they may transfer back. Um, so we, we do have situations where a patient at Glencliff may destabilize and need to come back to the hospital. Okay, thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, yes. I, I, ju I just thank you. I just wanted to add that you do have supplemental information about some of the work that we've done around the forensic hospital. So you should have that in your materials. I didn't know if anyone had questions today or, or wanted to have a discussion about any of that. Well, you do have, you still have some time if you'd like to go over it. Um, yeah, I, so I, I guess there is a request. If you could just quickly run through that, that would be good. Sure, we can do that quickly. Thank I you. think Joe can cue that up. Thank you, Joe. So again, this is just an outline of what you're gonna see here in the slideshow. So systems needs. Um, so the background of this is that in New Hampshire, uh, we don't have any specific facilities utilized to treat acute mental illness and forensic patients, um, including those who are civilly committed for treatment. Um, currently they're cared for at the SPU, the Secure Psychiatric Unit. Um, some of those forensic patients are also treated at New Hampshire Hospital but our hospital is not well suited for this type of care due to some of the security needs that these patients have. In 2019, there was a lawsuit that was filed due to uh, unlawful confinement of a civilly committed patient in a correctional facility. These are the various populations um, that 
could potentially utilize a forensic hospital. So you can see most of them are civilly committed patients um, and the different uh, classifications are listed here as well as admission information um, at the SPU in 2019 and 2020. As it relates to emergency room boarding, there are 24 beds at New Hampshire Hospital that are currently occupied by forensic patients. These patients do have a very long length of stay compared to regular admission units. If in the future, a 60 bed forensic hospital were constructed, those 24 beds at New Hampshire Hospital could be repurposed to help with emergency room boarding. Emergency room boarding would reduce due to the additional beds being available um, and that unit, that admission unit um, or what we would convert to an admission unit would have a shorter length of stay. So there would be more throughput here at the hospital. There's a little bit here just about the funding history, which you all probably are aware of. So those details are listed sort of um, in, you know, when an advisory council was established um, and then in the Senate phase of budget um, where there was an inclusion of 17.5 million in funding for the construction of the 25 bed forensic hospital. Um, so we believe that um, this was calculated, estimated, I'm sorry, this was calculated as half of the construction needs at the time. In committee of conference, the 17.5 million was reduced to 8.75. That, that money is non-lapsing. Um, and that's been funding that we've been utilizing um, to work on this project. So you can see that in the budget planning cycle, the governor's office reintroduced the original $17.5 million figure. It was included as part of HB2 instead of in a capital budget. And again, I'm trying to move quickly. The house has current at this point removed that um, from HB2. This is a, a funding summary. And again, you'll see this in your supplemental. We've been getting questions about billing. Um, there is the potential to bill, but it would not generate a significant amount of revenue. So this just brings us to, you know, what, what have we been doing again with the 8.75 million that was appropriated. In FY 2020, the first three months of the year were a continuing resolution. So there was little progress made. In October of 2020, the continuing resolution ended and design conversations began with public works. And then COVID uh, happened in January of 2020 and really became the sole fo focus of the department in New Hampshire Hospital. Once our staff were fully vaccinated in January of 2021, we started to work on the project again. And we've had initial design meetings that have taken place and ar an architect has been contracted through public works. We've begun to outline design requirements. So um, building and, and uh, you know, really just operational requirements that we might have around programming. We've also met with the city of Concord um, and their planning board um, to, to explain that we are moving forward with a project that might potentially be located in Concord. So the really, Thinking about this design, what we intend to do is finish the design of a facility for 25 beds. Our design um, is intended to be one that could expand to 60 if there was funding that allowed and a need. During the house phase, we had identified a potential site on the corner of Clinton and Fruit Street, um, and we're considering utilizing that space, but we have since moved away from this site. We will not um, utilize that site. Currently, our most recent design conversations have focused on doing an addition to New Hampshire Hospital. This is a very rough, and I mean very rough, um, design. Um, just looking at feasibility, and you know, could we do an addition to the hospital? And we could. Um, so this very rough uh, design shows in the beige color where that 25 bed facility would be located. The gray squares, could be future additions if they were needed, but the beige is what we would propose. 
So again, this is very preliminary. We have moved away from that corner of Fruit and Clinton as a site. Um, and we've just really been focusing our design conversations on an addition to New Hampshire Hospital, which would be a 24 or 25 bed forensic hospital. This slide just talks about how we're working, how we would work with Public Works through the RFP process. And this is really where we are now, um, making final decisions about what would be required of this hospital, talking with stakeholders and getting input, partnering with the legislature to identify funding, and ultimately issuing an RFP for a design build. Thank you, Heather. Uh, I see welcome. Senator Rosenwald has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Heather, um, when we were working on the budget that we're currently in, we asked the department if uh, there could not be an addition to New Hampshire Hospital as a way of doing this. And the department told us, no, we cannot expand there. So I'm curious what has changed to make um, an expansion of New Hampshire Hospital possible when it wasn't a year and a half ago? Right, I, you know, and I, I wasn't a part of the conversations a year and a half ago, and thank you, Senator, for the question. I think that what this has come down to is the fact that, um, you know, utilizing this campus um, and utilizing the, uh, you know, original site and having a completely separate um, hospital was was preferred. Um, and I think that for forensic programming, that was the initial preferred approach. But at this point, because we couldn't find an appropriate site, um, the plan that you saw actually would be um, placed on where we have a parking lot right now. <laughs> so um, while not ideal, um, the, the architects tell us that it is doable. And the other reason I think that, that we have shifted in our approach is that there's a hope to add efficiency by using some of the services here at the hospital. So relying on um, some of the services like kitchen, administrative functions, um, that was a benefit, I think, um, to add efficiency operationally. Could I follow up, please? Follow up. Um, thank you. I mean, I guess it's a, uh, you know, a question of really of, of policy, public policy, but if the goal is to open up more beds at New Hampshire Hospital, and on the one hand, you could build another institution that's bigger, or on the other hand, you could fund more community treatment services that would mitigate the need to have so many people at inpatient hospitals. Why? What is the argument for institutionalizing more people rather than trying to head off a medical and psychiatric crisis in the community in the first place? Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Just thinking about, you know, really zooming out and looking at this big picture um, for these folks. I think, I think that that takes time. Um, and I think that in the meantime, there has been really an ongoing concern about the civilly committed patients that are currently at the SPU. And although this, you know, this 24 bed um, hospital wouldn't add huge capacity here for us at the hospital, it would allow all of the programming for the civilly committed patients to happen here. Um, rather than some of, you know, the various transitions and care that currently happen. So the benefit, I think, for those patients is, first of all, they would be removed from the prison system and be in a hospital system. Um, and secondly, we have robust forensic programming already here. Um, and so that would add some continuity with the team that's here, um, really from start to finish. So for those patients, um, it's a big benefit in the now, I guess, would be my answer rather than, you know, sort of the long term. I agree with you, though. Um, certainly the preventative care that needs to happen in the community and the, the use of resources for that is, is, is so important. I, I think it's, it's a tough question to answer, you know, how much of, of which and when. It's tough. Final follow-up, if I could, Mr. Chairman, 
um, is the department um, committed to having this new 25 bed facility be state run or are you considering private prison companies? I have not had those conversations internally at this point um, about having private companies. To be honest with you, we haven't gotten that far in the process, Senator Rosenwald. We really have been much more focused on, you know, what would the what would the building need? What would the programming need to be? Um, so I just we haven't had those conversations yet. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Moss. Yeah. Heather, the, um, my concern is twofold. One, it, the House had some kind of presentation where they basically said, we don't need to do this at all. Um, and I think the Senate would need some compelling reason to do it. Um, and I think the opportunity is there financially, but um, we, the story needs to be we're responding to the lawsuit, why? And we, we don't have much time to give that. Um, I think Senator Bradley and I met on this and, and we said what we needed was something that basically said why we would put 25 or 30 or 40 or 50 beds um, anywhere mm -hmm. um, in order to get the house in discussions with the Senate. The second thing is, um, I think we need, I, I understand you needing the leeway on what this is going to cost and how you're going to construct it, but we need some kind of guidance. I mean, for us to pick a number of 35 or 40 or $50 million, we would need something a little stronger than, are we doing 25 beds? Are we doing 60 beds? And the, uh, the overall intention of what those beds are going to um, require from a construction point of view. I mean, I don't have a problem with New Hampshire Hospital. It's not like we haven't talked about this before. And I do sense that because of other things happening in the state, you know, New Hampshire Hospital may be able to push off some DRF beds. Um, so... I think there's an opportunity here, but I think it has to be defined a lot more in order for the Senate to carry this in the next couple of weeks in the budget. So. Sure, Joe, do you mind backing up to the slide that talked about the price breakdown? I think to, to answer your question, Senator, about you know what's the focus of the department at this point, really the focus is the 25 beds. That, that's where we've landed on this. That is, our, that is re really what we call phase one. Um, we have this additional information about the 60 bed that could you know, be the phase two of this project, but um, our, our sort of intention behind this at this point is focusing on 25 beds. So you have the estimate there for construction and then you also have an operating budget that's listed there for the 25 beds. And you know, to, to answer your, your part one question of the why, I think that the reason to do this really is to allow the uh, you know, immediate transfer of those patients that are at the SPU right now um, to have the program in place here um, moving forward for any civilly committed um, patient. The other thing that I think is a big benefit is the ability for um, the county jails to utilize this um, forensic hospital. Right now, we do have patients that are probated here at New Hampshire Hospital, but some of them are also probated over to the SPU. Um, and this would allow um, really some continuity of, of operations. It would be, you know, the same approach for the counties to utilize for any of their patients that needed this acute psychiatric care. So that would be a benefit, which would all, you know, and it's not a huge win for the hospital as it stands now, um, but it would be some patients that would be offset onto this unit instead of a typical admission unit. And again, they would get the programming um, that they need. Follow up. Follow up. Heather, on the, are you working with admin services when you're carrying a 2021 number and a 2223 number? Is that coming from them? 
Joe, can you answer that? Yeah, um, so yes, we are working with uh, Public Works down at the Department of Administrative Services. Um, the estimates that we have here are based off of uh, essentially 10% design architectural studies, um, which is what we are currently contracted for. Um, and so they are based off of an architectural firm's uh, uh, design up to, you know, 10%. So it's, it's kind of the shell and, and um, based off of square footage requirements and, and things of that nature. Um, there are some additional considerations uh, in addition to that, um, that, that could move the number uh, one way or the other. That's really about the site work. Um, and because we're building on top of a parking lot that may have utilities that run underneath it and things of that nature, um, you know, those are some of the unknown factors of the cost per se, but these are based off of architectural um, um, designs. Um, and then the operating budget um, that is based off of a model uh, that my staff has built based off of historical information from New Hampshire Hospital, consultation with the Department of Corrections. Um, and then we have a consultant engaged through the architectural firm who um, previously ran forensic facilities in other states. And so, so that operating budget is really designed based off the input from those three, um, those three information sources. But it, there's no anticipation further. There's no anticipation that we're going to be operating this within a two-year biennium, is there? I that's correct. That's correct. Um, we've we've just been asked the kind of the, the question of what's our total investment in this. So beyond the capital budget, um, how much would this facility really run uh, uh, take to run? Um, and so that's why we provided these. But I, I agree with you. We wouldn't be really entertaining operation uh, operating budgets until at least twenty four twenty five. Okay. Thank you, Senator Hennessy. Thank you. Um, this is, a, I think this would be for Joe. Uh, so when looking at the operating budget, say just for the 25 beds, the 27 million a year, what, have you identified any savings in the pipeline of where these people formerly would have been housed and what the savings might be? Um, we have not. So I guess at a 25 bed um, amount, um, those changes would, would really happen at the Department of Corrections and the Secure Psychiatric Unit. I do, however, think that um, given a lot of other needs that they have at the Department of Corrections, they would likely repurpose um, um, staff or, or something to that effect. Um, but we have not had uh, kind of a, a formal analysis of any uh, potential savings that could occur elsewhere. Thank you. Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. I have a question about the operating cost as well. For the 25 bed hospital that breaks down basically to $3,000 per patient per day, which is significantly higher than the cost at New Hampshire Hospital or, uh, or the prison. And so I'm wondering what the um, increase in programming or treatment capacity or outcomes would be to justify um, that investment? Yeah, so um, in the, the design of the, the facility, our intention is to have smaller units that would allow for um, uh, the ability to safely manage different patient populations. And I, I think Heather can probably speak to that a little bit better than I can. Um, but by having smaller units, so for example, uh, we're talking about eight bed units potentially for the forensic hospital, whereas at New Hampshire Hospital, we have 24 bed units. Um, you have a higher kind of staffing ratio per patient, and that's really indicative of the acuity of those individuals uh, and how you manage safety uh, within the building for both patients and staff. Um, so that's really what drives the cost difference between the two facilities. Um, I do want to note that as the facility gets larger, you also get some economies of scale. Um, so again, at a 25 bed facility, um, you have a kind of a, a certain level of support staff that's required. Uh, but as you grow, that support staff can, can uh, likely serve a, a larger population, if you will. Um, so so it's, it's an economies of scale issue, um, but also uh, the intent of designing smaller units so that we can better manage safety. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. For the thank you so much. Thank you. 
And our last presentation will be the Division of Children, Youth, and Families. Okay, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Daniels and the Senate uh, Finance Committee. My name is Joseph Ripsom, Director of DCYF. My pleasure to spend part of the afternoon with you today. Um, I'm gonna pull up a slideshow, which has quite a bit of data. Um, at the chair's discretion, I'm happy to take questions if things arise related to that data directly, or if folks would rather wait till the end, I'm okay with that as well, whatever, whatever works for the group. And if you give me one second, I'll pull that up. Okay, um, Division for Children, Youth and Families. Our mission is to partner with families and communities, to provide resources and supports that lead to the safety and healthy development of children, youth, and the communities in which they live. Um, really are responsible for three primary things here at DCYF Child Protective Services. That includes the investigation and assessment of all allegations of abuse or neglect. Um, and providing for the safety, permanency, and well-being of child victims or children at risk of maltreatment. Juvenile justice services, which is to support children and youth to remediate challenges with delinquency to promote child, family, and community safety. Support children and youth as needed, um, as identified as children in need of services. And then finally, the Senior New Youth Services Center, which is the state's only secured facility for detained and committed youth. That is to provide a safe and secure environment for all detained and committed youth in New Hampshire to receive crisis intervention, mental and physical health care, educational services in a secured setting, ensure the safety and well being of committed and detained youth, as well as the overall safety of the community. I'm going to move through um, talking a little bit about what we're seeing in these different sec sectors uh, within DCYF, starting with child protective services, then moving into juvenile justice, and finally SYSC. And like I said, if if folks have questions about these things as they come up, I'm happy to take them then. I'm also happy to take them at the end. Much of the data that I'm sharing today is actually now published as of March on a monthly dashboard that we post on the web so that folks can actually see these things regularly now, trying to increase transparency and understanding of what we're seeing within the child protection and juvenile justice systems in the state. Um, first slide here is the calls to intake. So when a child abuse case starts, it starts with a call to our, what people sometimes refer to as the hotline. The slides you're going to see um, are more or less structured in the same way, where you have uh, these different years by month in different colors, 2018 in green, 2019 in orange, 2020 in blue, and 2021 in pink. And you'll notice, of course, 2020 starts looking pretty odd around March when COVID hits before coming back to uh, something resembling normalcy um, towards the end of the year, and then um, actually some increases since that time. Um, so what you do see here is that you do see a little bit of cyclical uh, reporting, which you would tend to see every single year. Summers tend to always be slow. Um, that's because schools are closed and kids are not seeing people the way that they typically would. So we have less calls to the intake line. Um, you also see that same dynamic play out even more extreme in 2020 in those first months of COVID where you can see the um, drop um, of calls to the intake line in April 2020, May 2020, June 2020, before the summertime starting to approximate normalcy. And then when the schools reopened, call volume remained on the low end, but not, not what I would consider to be unusually low. Um, you have to remember when you're thinking about the child protection system here is that as I'm sure everybody in this committee remembers, the child protection system here was really in a point of crisis, you know, five years ago. Um, when that occurred, the system really, the child protection assessment system and intake system really expanded drastically. So 2019, um, for all intents and purposes, was a record high year. And um, so when you're drawing comparisons to prior years, you probably don't want to always consider just the 2018 and 2019, but you might want to look even further back to see what we've done in the past. Um, 2021, you see here, starts out in pink, um, really looking similar to prior years in January and February before March, actually spiking to be a record high March call volume to central intake. The next slide 
is new assessments. So when a call comes into central intake, a couple different things could happen. Um, it could be screened in for an assessment or an investigation. Um, it also could be screened out. It might be screened out if they don't make an allegation of abuse or neglect. It might be considered screened out because they're adding information to a prior call or a prior investigation that's already open. We often get multiple calls about a singular incident, sometimes even from the same caller, um, where they learn something new, you know, in the hours or the days after the initial call and they're calling in to add information. Um, the other big thing you're going to see here, though, is that in addition to the drop, which was COVID related, is that there's a shift in really starting in 2020 about how many things are getting screened in compared to how many calls we get. And that's uh, part of a deliberate practice change that we started in 2019. Um, our system had in the years prior gotten to a point where we were screening in probably a lot of things that didn't meet the legal definition of an abuse and neglect investigation. And a lot of things where families were relatively low risk and would be better served by a referral to a community agency like a family resource center rather than having a child abuse investigator come knock on their door. Um, not a great use of resources, but also not really the best way to interact with families, that if a family doesn't need to have an intervention with the child protective investigator, it can actually sometimes have the adverse reaction of drawing those families um, further away from the supports and services that they need. So um, one place where this really play, spells out pretty clearly, right, if you look at um, just March of 2021, you see that the call volume was well above the prior couple of years but the actual screen-in rate, the number of cases that were actually investigated was comparable to prior years. And the difference that you're seeing there is this change in practice. Um, this is also really important when talking about things like trying to right-size our workload for our workforce, getting caseloads down to reasonable numbers, as you'll see as we move further ahead. Um, you do see again with the assessment volume um, during COVID, a really big drop during those early months, starting to approximate normalcy again over the summertime. Um, and then really kind of back into back into what you typically see um, at this point now that kids and families are in the community and back in school in ways that they they more typically are. <clears throat> so this is our uh, child protective caseload data. As folks will remember, um, you know when I first arrived at this state about three and a half years ago, our caseloads were somewhere around 60 per assessment worker. National standards say they should be somewhere around 12. Um, you can see here going back to January 16, which is really when the system was in was an acute crisis, having over 90 assessments per assessment worker, which was um, probably the worst anywhere in the country at the time. Um, we were lucky to receive support from um, from the legislature and unanimous support, I believe, in the Senate on this portion of the budget uh, around improving our uh, the number of caseworkers that we have in the state, and we've seen that play out. Um, with a real sharp reduction in the number of uh, open cases per staff. That combined with the work that I was just talking about at intake, um, combined with some of the other preventative work that's being done to try to keep families from coming to us in the first place, um, we're hoping that those things will help continue to drive down the number of assessments and ultimately help us get to that caseload target of 12. You'll see here, um, you know, you saw a precipitous drop around starting September, November of 2019, which is when those new staff that we started to hire in July of 19, we were able to start getting trained. And you see that number continue to drop, really accelerating as COVID picked up with the reduced call volume. And we've been able to sustain this number around 17 assessments per staff since that time. Um, I'd like to see this number continue to go down. We still have a number of vacancies that we're trying to fill. And you combine that with the reality that you saw in the last slide that the number of assessments is growing. I'm glad to see that we've at least been able to maintain um, the same level um, by being able to increase staff at the same time that the number of assessments are growing. And hopefully we catch up with that and uh, push over the, the finish line and get our numbers down to about 12. Termination is that allegation of abuse or neglect substantiated or not? And if it is substantiated, um, Please let me know if anybody's having trouble hearing me. I just got to notice that my internet connection is, is unstable. So, um, but if a finding is substantiated, then a decision needs to be made about whether we need to open up a case to further support and stabilize that family and to keep that child safe. Sometimes that means a child's removed from the home. More often than not, it means that the child remains at home, but services are put into place to work with that child. What you see here is the number of family service cases. So that's the number of times that we open up a case 
following an assessment to work with the family. These are overwhelmingly involving court. Um, there are voluntary cases that were uh, reinstituted um, just prior to the last biennium. So some of what you see in here are so-called voluntary cases, which basically means that we're working with the family on a voluntary basis without court involvement. But the vast majority of what you see here is um, court involved cases. You do see really what has been a growth year after year in the number of family service cases that are opening up. Um, the exception of that being during that COVID period where it dipped, but we're now at a point where we're seeing the number of family service cases continue to grow, um, you know, really at their highest level um, yet. Um, when we look at some of the data later, you'll see one of the trend lines that I'm really pleased with is that while the number of families that we're serving is growing, the way that we're serving them is different in that we have fewer kids going into out-of-home care, which is one of the key metrics that I was looking for when I, when I came to the state and trying to work on the system was recognizing that we knew families were at risk, we knew kids were at risk, we knew that we needed to work with these families to help stabilize them, but we did not want to have to take kids unnecessarily into foster care. And I'm glad to say that what we're seeing in the data is that while we are working with more families, we aren't seeing the number of kids in foster care grow. In fact, we're seeing it decrease. So this is the caseloads for our family service cases. Again, those are those cases that are typically in court those more intensive cases. The goal here is a target of no more than 10 cases per worker. You do see the numbers, you know, had grown and stabilized somewhere around 15 over the years. It's now been bouncing around this 12 or this uh, 13 to 14 number. Um, I do anticipate that as we're able to continue hiring and getting folks trained to carry cases, we'll see that number pushed down to close to that target number of 10. This next slide here is what I was, um, oh, actually this is, Juvenile justice, I'm sorry, we'll go back to kids and out of home care in a moment because those slides are combined between juvenile justice and child protection. So juvenile justice cases um, open by state fiscal year, you see in juvenile justice as well in state fiscal year 20, the numbers really started to drop precipitously as courts weren't seeing kids as frequently and as kids weren't in school. In fact, many, many juvenile justice cases initiate with referrals that start in schools. Um, so with schools being closed, you saw juvenile justice cases drop pretty rapidly. With schools reopening, um, truancy complaints and things like that coming in, we are seeing those numbers start to climb again. So this pink number here, um, low by historical standards, although I think now with more schools opening and um, courts being able to process these cases again, we're going to continue to see these numbers grow a little bit. Um, I'd hope not to see them get back up to 2018 levels. I think we probably were open more often than we needed to be there. We also have a couple major initiatives underway that, are, that should be driving these numbers down. Um, you heard Katya Fox earlier speak about the children's system of care work, which I'm happy to, to speak about at length if folks are interested. Um, that work should be driving down the number of kids that come into the juvenile justice system. The other is Senate Bill 94, which passed in the Senate, thankfully. Um, thank you all who supported that. I believe it was unanimous in the Senate and uh, has had a favorable hearing in the House a couple weeks ago. So I'm looking forward to that moving forward in the House as well. Um, that bill is gonna create a process by which we have some of our juvenile justice staff have their roles shift to actually work with kids post arrest, but pre-court to be able to see what those kids needs are and try to direct them to services outside of court. Um, reducing the number of kids that formally have to come into the juvenile justice system and hopefully giving them the services that they need sooner so that we end up with less kids in deep end interventions, um, whether that be probation or residential care or this new youth services center. This is the caseload for juvenile justice. Um, you know, it's really been much more steady than you see on the child protection side, hovering really normally around that 15 level, except for uh, during the peaks of COVID when those numbers are really going down and they're starting to climb back up again. Uh, but we have not seen the kind of uh, rapid changes or uh, shifts in juvenile justice and instability in juvenile justice the way that we saw in child protection over the past you know, five years or so. Thank you, Joe. I think we had a question on the previous slide. Sure. Senator Guida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Joe, uh, thank you for your good work. I, uh, I'm interested in if this is the place where juvenile diversion funds are appropriated. Yeah, I think Karen or Rebecca could best could give you the give you the exact class line, but um, yeah, within one of our service accounts is where those funds, the diversion funds, would be appropriated. I don't know, Rebecca, right. if you know if you know exactly what line that would go to. Right, um, as it stands right now, there are no funds appropriated there. Um, That's correct. And okay, thank you. 
Yep. Yeah, and it's something I, I do appreciate, Senator Guy, to the question. I appreciate your support for the diversion programs too over the years. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, particularly when I spoke about Senate Bill 94 in the past, right, when I talked about the idea that our staff would perform an assessment and kind of try to drive kids to the right interventions outside of the formal system, um, those formal diversion programs would be one of those, not the only one, but certainly one of them. And the continued support for that would be helpful in us in our ability to make that, that new Senate Bill 94 um, successful. Follow up, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the previous biennium funded it at 300,000 a year lapsing. Uh, is 300,000 per year enough or do you need, what would you estimate or would Rebecca or whomever estimate is, is a number? Yeah, I mean, if, you know, if I was really gonna design that system to be sustainable and well supported, I think it would have to be you know, quite a bit more than that. Um, what that $300,000 a year allowed for was grants of, I think somewhere around 15, $17,000 to a handful of programs around the state that were, for the most part, already existing and served a relatively small um, portion of the state. Ideally, I'd like to see a diversion network in the state that is um, funded to cover the entire state um, and that is able to meet the needs of all kids in a relatively uniform way. Um, so to do something like that would probably require something about $100,000 per program. Um, I'd guess you probably need somewhere between 10 and 12 total programs for the state, at least one per county. And, a couple for your bigger areas. Um, so probably something more like, again, this is just back of the envelope, but somewhere more around a million to 1.2 million to really to really build out a network that I think could be, um, could really be robust enough to meet the full need. I think we also would want to take a look at kind of what our expected outcomes of all that is. The way the current program was designed, we, um, the way the current program is designed it's really just a grant program to help support the existing pro the existing things that are out in the community already. Um, I think I would prefer to see the structure in a way where we had some outcome measures built in, maybe a, a competitive procurement to try to make sure that we get coverage for the full state um, and treat it more like we treat one of our normal our normal contracted services. You know, historically, diversion to see has been a local enterprise um, that some jurisdictions um, engage in and that other jurisdictions do not engage in. Oh, follow up, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, um, the statistics on the success of that diversion versus the traditional courts uh, is, is staggering. And the yeah. cost savings to the taxpayers are ridiculously good. That's why I'm such a strong supporter of it. And I'd like to talk to you more after. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to talk to you about it more. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further questions, please continue. Sure. So this next slide is what I was speaking about before about the number of youth in out-of-home care. Um, so while we've seen growth in the number of kids um, with, you know, open family service cases and even some growth in, um, you know, recent months in the number of assessments, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that the number of kids in out-of-home care continues to decrease. And that's because we've been putting more and more into different types of community-based services to support families um, when, kids are, when kids are at risk um, and to support kids in their own communities when they're involved in the juvenile justice system. Um, so you do see right in state fiscal year 2018, you know, being somewhere around 1400 kids in out of home care between child protection and juvenile justice at any given time. And then more recently being somewhere down here to around 1200. I actually think we can keep pushing this number down. This is com combined kids in residential programs and foster care. So any kid who's in out of home care for any of the systems. Um, and this is one of the things that I think is you know, really important that we try to keep putting our focus on making sure families are strong in the first instance, that if they come into contact with DCYF, that we do whatever we can to try to strengthen those families and keep those families intact where you can do so safely. I don't wanna say that you, you know, certainly there are times when kids for their own safety do need to be removed from their home and that's a tool that the system needs and needs to employ when, um, when kids are really um, unsafe. But in many instances, we can do a lot of work with families to keep kids safe and get the families the help that they need. Um, Sununu Youth Services Center. So I know there's been an awful lot of attention to this. Happy to take questions about this topic as well. Here you see kind of overall census by state fiscal year. You do see the decrease. This is the average daily population or the average population in those state fiscal years. So 2016, you know, a little over average of a little over 50, same with 2017, dropping down to 2020 where the average daily census was around 17. Um, the blue line here that you see are the total number of youths 
who have been served at SYSC during those years. And you do see the number of admissions and discharges here. The green and the light blue is higher than the total number of youths. That's because there are a number of youths who will come through the, through the doors of SYSC more than once in a given year. Um, it's a really dynamic number. People hear the, you know, the average of 17 or other people will sometimes cherry pick a number and say, oh, there's only six kids in the facility or only eight kids in the facility. Um, what you see here is what the census is every day for the past year and change. Um, the green number being the total census around every day. And you see it changes from, you know, peak of last February of uh, 26, 27 ish um, down to a low um, this, uh, this past um, January of about, I think it was eight kids or seven kids. Um, today, the census is somewhere in the upper teens. The other thing you see here is this yellow line and this orange line. The yellow are the number of detained youth, the orange are the number of committed youth. The difference there is key. Um, the number of committed youth, those are the youth who have been fully processed through the courts in order to be committed to SYSC for a period of time. Typically, that's a three month length of stay at SYSC. Um, but for more serious offenses, it could be a six month length of stay for youth who are committed as juvenile offenders. The detained youth, which is the yellow bar here, that's a, actually a couple different populations mixed. So that is your short term detention. That's when a kid um, gets arrested and they're placed there pending the courts making another disposition. Sometimes those young people are there for just a matter of days or weeks um, before they're released. Um, but that also includes what we call kind of the long-term detained population, which would be young people who are charged as adults for very serious crimes. And those young people will stay in the facility for the entirety of their minority typically, and then move on to the um, adult correctional facility when, the, uh, when they finally age out of the SYSC system. Um, challenges for the upcoming year, um, or really the upcoming biennium. You know, just calling out the housing instability as being a, a significant contributing factor for children entering foster care. It's often a barrier to reunification for kids who can go home, except for the fact that their families don't have stable housing and a challenge for trans transition age youth. That's youth who are aging out of our system and moving on to adulthood. Um, I know uh, when Chris Antonello spoke, she shared quite a bit about the work happening in the housing space. We've been partnering with them on that and are very eager to see the progress made in that space. Um, recruitment and retention of staff, um, I did share the data around the improved um, caseload numbers. Um, we still have a turnover rate that's, that I'd consider to be an unhealthy number on a state fiscal year 19. The total turnover rate was something like 20% when you excluded um, promotions um, because we also hired a lot of supervisors last year. So a lot of people took promotional opportunities from within. When you exclude those promotions, it was about 17%. Um, so that still is higher than I'd like to see. For a large organization, people talk about a, a healthy turnover rate of being somewhere like 10%, right? People are going to retire. They're going to take other jobs. That's normal. Um, but I'd like to see us get that number down. Um, family strengthening programs for families prior to DCYF involvement. So as I mentioned before, we're doing this work at intake um, around trying to refer, refer families away from a child protection investigation if that's not necessary. And where they typically get referred to is to a family resource center. Um, since we started doing that about a year ago, we are hearing from some of the family resource centers that they're strained um, with the number of families being referred to them. Um, so that's something that, I've, that I'd like to I continue to work on with folks in the coming years. And I think the final major challenge for the coming biennium is really the replacement of SYSC or, or final decision making around what's going to happen with that, right? It's a facility originally designed to serve 144 kids. We have an average daily census typically somewhere in the, in the mid to high teens. Um, and I think those are numbers that are naturally going to continue to decline in the coming years, assuming that the system of care work continues to move forward the way is planned. And assuming that the SB 94 work and the diversion work that Senator Guy and I that we're just speaking about continues to move forward as planned, um, that we'd likely see that census, uh, like I said, which is currently in the mid to high teens, continue to go down, um, making the, the utilization of 144 bed facility, you know, just a, even more, um, more um, challenging than it is today. Joe, slide 14 that you are uh, showing oh, yes. now is different than the one we have? Yes, I apologize for that. I accidentally sent Karen um, a different version. We'll follow up and send this version to you. Which one is the latest, the, the one that you are showing? Yes. 
Okay, if you could just make sure that uh, Deb gets a copy yes. of, and then we can replace it. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And then the next two slides are just the budget detail. I think Rebecca, you were gonna share about these. Sure. Um, the two areas that were not funded by the house were the 22 CPSWs for each of the fiscal years, 23, uh, 22 and 23, and then um, fiscal year 23 for SYSB. And the other thing and that would I would- be, oh, Okay, go ahead. I was just gonna add the other thing I would add here about the uh, child protection budget is the change that you see in 22, 23 is because we did move some expenditures to Medicaid. Yes, yeah, so the, the reduction you're seeing here is not re reduced funding for services, it's just realigning the budget in a way that makes more sense. And then I think this is just reiterating the same, Rebecca? Correct, yeah, just breaking it out by year. Great, and I would say the 22 CPSW positions, these are not creating new positions, these were positions that were created in the last biennium. Um, um, we're not funded originally in the governor's phase, but the governor did include in a subsequent, in his subsequent letter that he supported funding these um, given the enhanced revenue projections. And these are positions that we, we do need to fill to continue pushing down the caseloads to what our, what our target ranges are. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Senator Hennessy. Thank you. Hi, Joe. Nice to see you. I have a question on the, when the House looked at the um, Sununu Youth Service Center budget on page 1117, I see a 30% jump from fiscal year 2020 actual to the governor and House proposed budget for 22. Can you tell me why there's such a steep increase? Um. I don't know, Karen or Rebecca, if you could help articulate that. Part of that has to do with a um, large number of vacancies at SYSC um, that were not. So because of that large number of vacancies as, as a, at SYSC, um, uh, unfortunately, a lot of time is spent there by our juvenile justice probation officers covering shifts, which isn't really a sustainable model and probably isn't the most cost-effective model because they cost more than youth counselor. Um, so I know that's one of the significant reasons why the SYSC budget um, actual expenditures is probably somewhat depressed from what um, from what uh, is projected in the budget. Follow up. And do you know what the projected lapse for 2021 is for that? I do not, Rebecca. Do you know that or Karen? While Rebecca is looking that up, part of the increased cost was um, contractual services for the Dartmouth contract and a little bit of change in the model of how we're using Dartmouth employees at SYSC. I don't know if you want to speak to that, Joe. Sure. Yeah, we, um, we have shifted. We previously had a full-time psychiatrist um, at SYSC when the population was greater. We've decided that um, we didn't need so much time from the psychiatrist, so we only have a quarter-time psychiatrist now, but we did add a full-time psychologist down there who is working to redesign the program model. Um, really to align it to best practices and clinical treatment needs um, in a way that probably is well overdue um, at the facility. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks, thank you. And with that, uh, we have completed our business for the day. Uh, tomorrow will be the public hearing. Uh, that will be split in uh, two sections. Uh, the first one will begin at one o'clock, the second at six o'clock. And we'll give you a break before the second one. Uh, my understanding right now is there are some 150 people who are signed up to speak. Um, so assuming three minutes each, you're looking about eight hours. So be prepared for a long day tomorrow. 
And uh, at that, I will look for a motion to adjourn. Second. Mo moved by Senator Guida, seconded by Senator Hennessy. Call roll. Senator Morse. Senator Hennessy. Yes. Senator Guida. Yes. Senator Rosenwald. Yes. And Senator D'Alessandro and Senator Reagan are excused. And the chair votes yes, and we will be adjourned for the day. Thank you.